2.4 million jobs in April, those jobs will come back. So it's a really, really good start on the reopening. Congress enacted, the president signed something called the Payroll Protection Program to try to make sure people either didn't lose their jobs or got hired back. Is there any way of knowing what effect the PPP may have had on these jobs numbers? Uh, we think the PPP was helpful in uh, keeping people uh, on payroll, chats to the employer. H hard to know uh, exactly where it factors in. The Small Business Administration, which administers the program, estimates that tens of millions of workers have gotten the benefit of that program by uh, staying on payroll. And w one of the things I've always liked about the program the most, and we've talked about before, is that it poises uh, uh, workers to come back quickly. They, they're still connected to their employer. The employer still has workers ready to go. So th the program, in addition to just getting money to people who need it, uh, should also help us reopen more quickly than we might otherwise have done. Back when I ran an operating unit at the Walt Disney Company, ABC News, one of the questions I'd ask when things like this happen, nice surprising numbers, is it timing or is it real? That is to say, are we just moving up some numbers that otherwise we'd see a little later? So does this indicate something about the size of the overall recovery, how many jobs we can get back, or is it more it happened earlier than we thought it would? I think it's a very good question, and I think it's both. It definitely happened sooner uh, than we expected. What this shows is that the uh, rebound was already happening uh, faster, bigger uh, than projected. But I think the fact that we uh, put back 2.5 million jobs uh, so quickly is encouraging for the long haul. A number that I've looked at closely the last couple months is how many workers say they uh, were put out of work temporarily. And that number remains extremely high. For April, it was uh, just about 90%. And uh, for May, it was about 85% still think that they're going back to the job they had. So that's really uh, another sign that uh, just as we came into this downturn by a completely different route than any other economic difficulty we've had before, uh, we can come out in a, in, a, in a different and, I think, faster way. This is a, a great number. I mean, everyone agrees this is a great number. Uh, at, at the same time, we have a long way to go. Uh, two and a half million is almost a drop in the bucket compared to the tens of millions who've lost their jobs here. Uh, what comes next, do we think, in terms of getting jobs back? And, and how long will it take to get us back to where we were? Um, you, you're right, David. We, we, we still have ways to go. Nobody's uh, uh, proclaiming victory at this point. We're still working with the states, for example, to help them get those unemployment payments out to uh, people who are entitled to them. That that remains a, a priority. Uh, I uh, have been asked a number of times whether I thought we could get uh, back below 10% unemployment this year. Uh, I, I now am uh, even more confident that we can do that. I think this uh, will have, I think, uh, a report for the month of June that's uh, at least as uh, as positive as the one we saw for May. And I did want to comment on uh, another number in the report. Uh, it's been observed that there was a very, very slight uptick in um, unemployment for African Americans, and that's true. But when you drill in, what you find is that actually uh, about nearly 300,000 African Americans uh, found jobs in, in May. It's just that they entered the workforce in even larger numbers. And one of the things you look for when you're looking for recovery is increased labor force participation. So that's actually another good sign in this report. We, we obviously want that unemployment number coming down, but we see that African Americans did get jobs and are coming back into the workforce. I was going to ask you about that, Mr. Secretary, so I'm glad you raised it because all of us noticed that uptick. And, and both uh, white and Hispanic unemployment went down substantially, actually, and there was a slight uptick for African Americans. How much of that do we know is because African Americans uh, often are congregated in urban centers that were particularly hard hit by COVID-19. I think about places like Detroit. It's majority African-American, things like that. And it's harder to get them back into the workforce. Do we have a sense of that, how much this is directly COVID related? Uh, I think that uh, it could well be that uh, a, a reason you didn't see uh, even larger numbers of African-Americans coming uh, back to work is, is it could be geographic. Uh, it could, could be particular sectors, government employment, uh, uh, actually lost jobs in May. We, we, those are jobs we know also will come back 
uh, by the way. Uh, but um, I think there are more African Americans in that sector than in some other sectors, and so they may fe- be feeling the impact uh, there too. You mentioned unemployment insurance, uh, and there's a question about whether it needs to be extended, the, the special unemployment insurance or, or not. Also, some have suggested maybe it was a bit too rich the first time, uh, and it may have actually gave some people a perverse incentive not to take jobs because they might make more on unemployment. Where are you on that question about the extension of the supplemental unemployment insurance and what should be done with it? The $600 a week, which was added in the CARES Act, the president signed that act back in uh, March, and uh, it was $600 on top of uh, what was uh, made available by your uh, state. Uh, and so the average there could get up to around fifty dollars or $55,000 a year if you annualized it. Um, it. It was very important to get a substantial benefit out when we were shutting our economy down uh, back in March. But I think as we're opening now and as jobs are becoming available and we want people to go back to the workplace, I don't think the same strategy is going to make sense. Uh, what I'd like to do is keep watching uh, how these job markets develop in the next few weeks. The uh, $600 a week benefit expires at the end of July. Let's see where we are as that gets closer. But I don't think we're going to want to do something uh, exactly like what was done uh, initially when we were shutting our economy down. Mr. Secretary, you said that yeah, you were hopeful, at least, that the June numbers will be as good, maybe even better, but as good as the one we had for May. At the same time, we hear lots of reports about layoffs, significant layoffs being announced by some big companies. And you also have, on the demand side, some really weak numbers, like, for example, ISM manufacturing numbers, like the, the index is like 30.1. 50 is breaking even. Uh, do you see some more layoffs coming down the pipeline? Is there some bad news out there as well we haven't quite see hit the books yet? I think the news is, is uh, going to mostly be good. Obviously, there's always change in our economy. Uh, we know that there are some sectors, David, that are going to take longer to come back. Uh, an example being really any industry that depends on bringing large numbers of people together, uh, particularly in an indoor space. That That'll be slower, we, we know. And we know there have been some uh, knock-on effects, too, that uh, uh, some companies have had their supply chains disrupted and the like. So we'll, these are things to take a look at. But I think the overall arc that we've seen is really very positive. Uh, what we're seeing is that states are reopening. They're reopening safely. Uh, the jobs are coming back. And uh, it's starting to look uh, really uh, much brighter than people had feared just a few weeks ago. There are various proposals for further fiscal stimulus. Certainly, uh, Speaker Pelosi has a proposal. It reports out of the White House is working on it as well. Uh, do we need it? And let me specifically ask about one thing. You said the state jobs will come back. State and local employment jobs will come back. We hear from a lot of governors, Republican and Democrats, that if they don't get some money, they're going to have to lay off people. We had we had the governor of New Jersey actually say he thinks he might have to lay off a half of his people if he doesn't get some real help. Well, I know that that's a, a question that's been raised, is getting a look at it. Uh, I think there will uh, likely be uh, some additional legislation. Uh, it, it's certainly uh, being discussed. Uh, the exact content, again, I think it will depend in part on how uh, conditions on the ground develop over uh, the next next few weeks. In terms of stimulus, there there's there's been a lot uh, in the economy now with the uh, unemployment benefits that uh, were put out and the paycheck protection and uh, those economic impact payments by the IRS. Uh, another uh, bright spot in the economy right now is that savings really are uh, pretty high, individual savings. People weren't spending uh, all that much uh, during shutdowns, even as they were uh, still bringing in money uh, through uh, unemployment and the like. Uh, so let's see where we are. I, uh, I, let, let me emphasize this, though. Um, we had such an extremely strong economy uh, all the way through the end of February, and uh, that was brought about in substantial part by by limiting the size of government, by cutting taxes, by cutting unnecessary regulations, right. and uh, right. and so we have to remember that it's you know it's right. it's, it's free markets, it's it's free people that yep. that uh, yields those kinds of economic benefits. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mr. Secretary. Always a pleasure to have you with us. That's the Secretary of Labor. He's Eugene Scalia. That does it for Balance of Power for Bloomberg Radio for today. I'm David Weston. Thank you so much for joining us. At the start of every day, you can't predict. So I often struggled at school. Um, once, when we had a math test, I looked around the room and everyone was just doing it. And I couldn't. And I began to cry. But my teacher came over and said, it might look like one big problem, but it's just a handful of small ones. And you can deal with that. 
I hear her voice in my head for every problem I face to this day. Teaching. Every lesson shapes a life. You could get £26,000 tax-free to train as a teacher. Subject to eligibility, selected subjects only. Search Get Into Teaching. In case you didn't know, TuneIn lets you listen to the same radio stations you pick up on your home or car radio. Except you can hear them from anywhere. If you want to find a station from somewhere else in the world, navigate to the By Location section under Browse. Keep exploring with TuneIn. Want to relive the glory of college football? Balls over a man into the end zone. The end zone. Come explore TuneIn's classic game replay collection to hear ESPN's complete coverage of the 2019 New Year's Six Bowl games. Don't miss your chance to re-experience the Rose Bowl, the 2020 National Championship featuring Clemson and LSU. There are going to be two champions on the field tomorrow night. There's going to be one team hold up the trophy. Ten, play to the five. Search Classic Game Replay to listen for free. Brian Windhorst and the Hoop Collective Podcast. What about Giannis Antetokounmpo? He is going to be eligible to sign a Supermax extension, which we were projecting to be worth $240 million this summer. Well, if the salary cap drops, and even if he's wonderfully happy in Milwaukee, it may make no sense for him to sign when he can just wait a year and wait for the revenues to recover and then lock in. Subscribe to Brian Windhorst and the Hoop Collective. Search the Hoop Collective to listen. You love TuneIn for live breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on demand news shows on TuneIn. How do you keep track of all your favorite stations and podcasts? Easy. You add them to your favorites list. Just find the audio you want to bookmark and tap the heart icon. Then, whenever you want to browse your favorites, you'll find everything under the favorites tab. Who says you can't have a laugh while getting serious about America's pastime? <laughs> On the daily podcast, Locked On MLB, comedian and baseball fanatic Paul Francis Sullivan talks about each team, each pennant race, and everything else in the game from rule changes and controversies to baseball cards and stadium food for those of you who are not familiar with me or the old show i love to obsess over baseball i'm talking baseball over the super bowl we had a tv show in the division series during my wedding search locked on mlb on tune in to listen today of the world 24 hours a day at bloomberg.com on the bloomberg business app and on quick take by bloomberg this is bloomberg radio this is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine. Plus, global business, finance, and tech news as it happens. Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Jason Kelly on Bloomberg Radio. And live from New York and live from New Jersey, streaming on YouTube as well. It is Monday, June 8th, 2020. And Jason, week 13 working from home, it could be an unlucky number, right? 13. And yet there's lots of signs of optimism out there. Yeah, listen, you know, one of the stats that I am obsessed with is looking at the S&P year to date. We are within half a percent of making up everything that we lost this year. I know, like it, uh, forgive me for saying this, right, exactly, like it never happened. So, big day for New York City, right, the most important economy, safe to say, in the U.S., really one of the largest in the world. It begins phase one of its reopening after the virus. That's a big deal, Jason. We're going to talk a lot about that because, as you say, it's symbolic, but it goes beyond symbolism, too, because when New York gets back to work, a lot of things start to go from there. Speaking of back to work, he's always at work. (laughs) Charlie Pellet is with us for a Bloomberg Business Flash. Charlie. Working from home, and here's what's going on. We've got the Dow, the S&P, and NASDAQ. Look at that. Best level of the day on the S&P 500 index at a 15-week high. All of this about optimism on reopening. We will have more coming up right here on Bloomberg Business Week. Let's get right to the numbers. S&P up 22 right now. 32.16, up 7 tenths of 1%. As Jason mentioned, bringing its year-to-date loss to 0.4%. NASDAQ up another 65 points this Monday, up 7 tenths of 1%. NASDAQ so far for 2020 is up now by more 
than 10%. The Dow up 308, best level of the day there, up 1.1%. Tenure up 730 seconds with the yield now of 0.87%. Gold up 7 tenths of 1%, 1697 the ounce. Crude oil slumping, West Texas Intermediate down 3.2%, 38.28 a barrel. Again, recapping equities rally building on Friday's gains. S&P up 24 of 8 tenths of 1%. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. Much more to come, but given everything that we just said and what Charlie just said about where the markets are, let's set the Business Week agenda. It's an important day, as Carol said. Vincent Signorella is with us, Global Macro Strategist for Bloomberg. Joining us on the phone from White Plains, Vince, uh, as you know, contributes to the Macro Squawk Desk. Squawk, of course, is real-time curated news. Audio streamed directly through your terminal. Check it out at Squawk on your launch pad. And Dave Wilson, of course, is with us, Stocks Editor for Bloomberg, author of the chart and stock of the day. Uh, Dave, give us a quick snapshot of the internals of the trade. What's really driving us forward here? Well, you know, a lot of it is what we saw last week with uh, some of the stocks beating down the most this year and beyond, kind of leading the way back. Uh, you're seeing with energy stocks, industrial companies, financial companies, all kind of at the forefront of the gains. One thing that's interesting as the day has gone on, though, is that you're seeing some of the interest rate sensitive areas of the market sort of join in the rally. And we've seen bond yields move up. So, you know, that's not great news for utilities or for real estate companies, you know, because it means higher costs on their debt down the line. It means their dividend yields aren't as competitive necessarily when you compare them with bonds. Uh, and yet you look at the S&P 500 Utilities Index. It's the second best performer out of the 11 main industry groups in the S&P 500. And real estate is the third best. So, you know, it kind of tells you that there are all sorts of areas areas of the market that are taking part in the rally that uh, we've seen that, you know, if, if you were to go back a few weeks, we're kind of being left behind here. That's right. sort of the story of the past week, really, and it, it carries on with a bit of a twist today. Yeah, it feels like a, a big sigh of relief as the world sees New York City starting to reopen. This is such an important uh, economy to the overall health of the uh, country. Vince Signorella, come on in. On, I'm curious about some of the things that uh, you've been uh, seeing uh, this morning on the Macro Squawk Desk. What pretty much Dave is saying, it's uh, it's risk on, with the only exception being the Japanese yen gaining. Typically, that is a haven trade. So that's got traders confounded a little bit today, throwing a, a little wrench into things. Um, but it, the yen has faded quite a bit over the last uh, few days or so. We've just seen some options trading and probably some profit taking in there. I would suspect that if this rally continues, uh, would see the yen start to weaken again. But once again, that correlation between a weaker dollar and a higher stock market just keeps batting on. And we're now, give or take, about 13 points away in the S&P 500 cash from erasing all of the 2020 decline, which is just a phenomenal thing to even think about. It, it's remarkable, right, Vince? Don't you think about how, like, the history books are going to treat this? Is it just going to be, like, you know, a cup, a paragraph? <laughs> or is it something more substantial? Yeah. No, I think it'll, I think it'll definitely stand, uh, stand its own test of time. It's probably going to be a book in it somewhere for some financial novelist. Uh, yeah. It, or some financial journalist, rather. Yeah. Um, you know, just, or novelist, you because you can't really make it up. <laughs> <laughs> totally. True. I mean, this has really beat up a lot of people. I mean, Dreckenmiller uh, basically, you know, threw in the towel today and said, "I'm, I'm humbled. I missed it." You know, um, and and there are a lot of major players that have missed it and still aren't on board. I still have traders talking to me this morning, throwing me um, throwing me things off Twitter, which they would like me to say on the squawk, which are negative for risk, but just don't apply. You know, yeah. they're just they're just trying to get their their story out there. Um, this it, it looks real, it feels real. I mean, it's it, it there's we have the Fed on Wednesday. Yeah, in the meantime, going to put it, put the brakes on this rally. It'll be if the Fed counters yeah. some of their ra rational exuberance that they gave us the last time around. That's a really good point. We're going to get into that with um, Stephen Hankey a little bit later on. And I got to say, it comes on a day when the sit when Citigroup is warning equity euphoria at its highest since 2002. So you know, a lot for investors to consider. And it's only Monday, Jason Kelly. It is indeed. All right, gentlemen, thank you both so much. Really appreciate it. Vince Signorella, global macro strategist for Bloomberg, on the phone from White Plains. Dave Wilson will be back with us at three thirty. 
thirty with his chart of the day, and just after the close for his stock of the day, Carol. I feel like if we were going to throw some music in, we need a little bit of Beatles about the long and winding road. Yeah, it's for not sure. been that long, right? No, I mean, if you think no. about it. But we're coming back, and this is a big day. It it hasn't been long. I mean, certainly in the in the course and, and in the scope of history, and yet thirteen weeks feels like a long time. I mean, I was talking yeah. to a friend on the phone earlier, and, and you know, she was just saying, yeah, the last time she was in her office was. March 13th? I know. Right? March 13th, which right. was the last time we were in the office together. Officially officially was not spring. That's right. And here we are, almost officially summer. Yeah. <laughs> or the beginning of summer on the calendar. So, yeah, it's it's been a lo- I it it's been a long time. Uh, yeah. No doubt about it, and we've seen a lot of um, tough stuff, uh, no doubt about it. So, we're going to talk a lot about New York City. It's very important to the US economy, really to the world economy. It's going back to work. And then we're going to talk about investments that have sprung back big time. Kathy Wood, I am so excited to have her back with us. CEO at Arc Investments. Man, her calls since we began talking Talking with her years ago, Jason, as we know, have been spot on. We've highlighted her in the magazine. She talks about innovation and at times of unrest and stress is when you start to see markets being disrupted and you do see a lot of innovation. Yeah, longtime Tesla bull. I'm mm-hmm. sure she's going to uh, talk to us a little bit about that SpaceX uh, launch from a couple weeks ago when they rocked up to the launch pad in a Tesla. I'm yeah. sure that was a moment that she liked. Um, we're also going to catch up with Kishore Lula. If you haven't heard of him, you should because he is the CEO at Eros International. I've got to know him over the past couple years. It's the Netflix of India. Just pulled off a deal with a big Hollywood studio. His perspective on the world and the world of entertainment is one you are going to want to hear. That's for sure. Yeah, no doubt about it. And I'm also going to just uh, do a little bit of a tease. Our most read story on the Bloomberg in the past day or eight hours has to do with Jeff Bezos. Uh, it's quite a story, and we're going to talk about that in uh, a moment. We are, and it's a reminder that we can't get too far away of what we've experienced in the last couple of days. And I had a conversation that I'm going to tell you about a little bit later on for our sports uh, show okay. uh, with Terrell Davis because it's a reminder that we have a long way to go, and a lot of the unrest is really important to keep in the back of our minds, in the All front right. of our minds. Yeah, absolutely. So let's do the Bloomberg Business Week bite of the day. One number, Jason, that tells us a lot. It is 80%. An overwhelming majority of American voters believe that things are, quote, out of control in the country. This is according to an NBC News Wall Street Journal poll. The poll posing the question, when it comes to the country these days, do you generally feel that things in the country are... What? (laughs) To which 80% of respondents chose out of control versus 15% who chose under control. I feel like that says a lot, which reminds us we're in an election year, everybody. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Uh, Speaking of an election, speaking of world and national news, let's go to Nancy Lyman. She's got world and national headlines. Hey there. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Congressional Democrats are proposing legislation to overhaul police departments and bring more accountability. The Justice in Police Act would create a national database of excessive force episodes. Congresswoman Karen Bass of California says body cameras are already helping police the police. It is the cell phone camera that has exposed the continuation of violence directed at African Americans by the police and exposed the reality that the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is not guaranteed to all African Americans at all times. The legislation would also revise the federal criminal police misconduct statute to make it easier to prosecute officers who are involved in misconduct with knowing or reckless disregard. Well, the Minneapolis police officer charged with second-degree murder in George Floyd's death is scheduled to make his first court appearance today. Derek Chauvin is also charged with third-degree murder and second-degree manslaughter in Floyd's death. President Trump is trying to tie Joe Biden to calls to defund the police in an attempt to paint his political opponent as weak on crime. Trump's campaign communications director says the movement is growing. Biden is now forced to own it. Trump has been put on the defensive recently following that photo op last week in which riot police plowed through peaceful protesters. Those calling for defunding the police take a range of positions, including shifting money to programs to address economic and social ills that disproportionately affect blacks. But the rallying cry evokes the idea of abolishing police. Global news 24 hours a day, on air and on quick take by Bloomberg. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Nancy Lyons. Working from home. 
take a little more time for breakfast. Tom Keen. How will this pandemic change your NASDAQ? Jonathan Farrell. When you look at that sector, some of these companies won't exist, will they? And Lisa Abramowitz. They've only continued to increase the delinquencies and defaults. Crunch data topped with fresh world news. Bloomberg Surveillance. Weekday mornings at 7 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business App, and BloombergRadio.com. And now, watch us on Bloomberg Television. Right now, Doctors Without Borders medical teams are operating in some of the most remote and dangerous corners of the world. When front yards become front lines, at the crossroads of conflict and epidemic, where there are no hospitals, that's where we operate. Your response is critical to our response in places where few others will go. That's where we operate. Learn more at doctorswithoutborders.org. At Bloomberg, we know a lot of financial experts. He's a former president of the European Central Bank. Your global financial warriors is a classic textbook. A lot of political experts. If you were advising the president of the United States, what's the thing that he's not doing that he should do? And lucky for you, we know a lot of science experts, too. You talked about those reagents which are necessary for the testing. It's also the behavioral psychological approach. Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business App, and BloombergRadio.com. Bloomberg, the world is listening. Tom has been a teacher for over 40 years. One day, I think one of the students had asked the question and he didn't remember the answer. And I also noticed that he was letting his class out earlier than they were supposed to let out. I was really starting to worry. Levi and I talked about how it would change our lives, but he was there beside me. When something feels different, it could be Alzheimer's. Now is the time to talk. Visit alz.org slash our stories to learn more. A message from the Alzheimer's Association and the Ad Council. This, in- this is a message from the government about the emergency measures to support the economy during the period of disruption caused by the coronavirus. To help you, your business, and your workers affected, you can apply for cash grants, business rate holidays, statutory sick pay relief packages, as well as the coronavirus job retention and self-employment income support schemes. For information, go to gov.uk forward slash business dash support now. Where will 2020 take you? Somewhere where people care about each other, about our planet, about creating a better world for everyone and becoming the best versions of yourselves. Join a community of like-minded individuals at the University of Winchester. Make sure to accept your offer by the UCAS deadline and visit our website to find out more. See the bigger picture. Be the difference. Go to winchester.ac.uk. Get your cook on with Asta. With Uncle Ben's rice, 250 grams for just one pound. And our butcher's selection chicken breast fillets, only £3.40 for 650 grams. Why not whack it in the wok? At Asta, we're committed to low prices every day on the quality products you need. Asta. Selected stores and lines subject to availability. At Lloyds Bank, we know that money is a concern for a lot of people during this time. You just put pressure on yourself all the time. You, you, you just want to do your absolute best. You automatically then think... It's my fault. Yeah, oh, this is because <laughs> I've not... I've not Done X, Y, Z. Yeah, I've not raised the right. Whatever's playing on your mind at the moment, Lloyds Bank, in partnership with Mental Health UK, can offer you support and advice. Visit lloydsbank.com slash mental health. You love TuneIn for live breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on demand news shows on TuneIn. Ready for a one of a kind look at the NFL? On the PFF NFL podcast, Steve Palazzolo and Sam Munson interpret the unique stats of pro football focus to analyze the league, uncover secret superstars, and discuss which teams to watch out for in the next Super Bowl. Let's talk some football. Let's do it, Steve. All sorts of stuff. We're going to do most improved defenses around the NFL. Solomon Wilcox, our very own. He went, he went into some detail over at PFF.com. Most improved defenses around the NFL. Search PFF NFL on TuneIn to listen. With the NHL season temporarily on ice, now is a good time to catch up on past games. With game replay on TuneIn, you can listen to every power play, slap shot, and goal of the 2019-2020 season so far. Suter, Zakana, Dufiala, he scores! 
For a limited time, it's free for hockey fans everywhere. Search Classic Game Replays to start listening. In case you didn't know, TuneIn lets you listen to the same radio stations you pick up on your home or car radio, except you can hear them from anywhere. If you want to find a station from somewhere else in the world, navigate to the By Location section under Browse. Keep exploring with TuneIn. Want to relive the glory of college football? Balls over a man into the end zone. The end zone. Come explore TuneIn's classic game replay collection to hear ESPN's complete coverage of the 2019 New Year's Six Bowl games. Don't miss your chance to re-experience the Rose Bowl, the 2020 National Championship featuring Clemson and LSU. There's going to be two champions on the field tomorrow night. There's going to be one team hold up the trophy. Hey, Search Classic Game Replays to listen for free. Hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All Bloomberg World Headquarters. I'm Charlie Pellet. 15-week high for the S&P 500 index. Stocks are surging, building on Friday's rally. S&P up 24, now at 32.18, up by 8 tenths of 1%, narrowing its year-to-date loss to 0.4%. The Dow up almost 300 points, up 1.1%. Right now up 295 points. NASDAQ up 71, a gain there of 7 tenths of 1%. Stocks now at a 15-week high. The dollar fell as easing lockdowns bolstered economic optimism. We've got gold up 8 tenths of 1%, 16.98 the ounce, and West Texas intermediate crude now down 3.8%, 38.03 a barrel. Recapping a Monday rally underway with the S&P up 23, up 7 tenths of 1%. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. You are listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Jason Kelly and Carol Masser joining you. And the virus clearly uh, continues to be front of mind. And yet I feel like we're looking at it maybe in a more complicated way, in a more complex way, not in a bad way, uh, candidly, Carol. And this next guest has always kept us honest when we've talked yes. to him about some of the demographic, the socioeconomic elements of this that we cannot forget. Right, and I feel like it's been exacerbated or reminded even more because of the last couple of weeks. Um, the black community, right, again, impacted disproportionately um, when it comes to certainly the virus, we saw that, and then equality and justice. So perfect voice for us on this Monday. Uh, welcome back, Dr. Sandro Galea. He's dean and professor at Boston University School of Public um, health, and he's author of Pained, Uncomfortable Conversations About uh, the Public's Health. Uh, conversations, though, that need to be had. He joins us once again on the phone from Boston. Dr. Galea, uh, nice to have you back with us. Um, I do wonder, both Jason and I do, wonder how your thinking has continued to evolve because of what's happened, not only in the past 13 weeks because of the virus, we've talked to you about that, but then what's happened in the past two weeks, what we've seen out of Minneapolis. Yeah, first of all, thank you for having me always. I think what we're seeing coming out of Minneapolis is an expression of uh, justifiable, entirely understandable anger and frustration with decades and centuries long injustices. And that, I think, is reflected in the protests we have seen around police, around policing and around systemic racism. Now, when you think about that, one question you might ask, well, what does it have to do with COVID? What does it have to do with the moment we've been living through? But I would argue that these underlying structural forces that divide us, that divide us on racial ethnic lines, that divide us on social class lines, also are the story of COVID. COVID was a virus that, uh, you know, early on said, well, the virus affects everybody. Sure it does, but it doesn't affect everybody equally. We know now that the greater burden of COVID infections disproportionately falls on minorities, on uh, people of color. We know that uh, among those who are infected, the greater proportion of death, the greater likelihood of death falls on people of color and people who are socioeconomically marginalized. And that reflects this underlying division that shapes and colors our society. And those are really the same forces that we are now seeing flare up in uh, in this anger that emerged, obviously, from the George Floyd killing and the other killings around it. So we do have here commonalities. We have essentially a pandemic, unemployment, civil unrest, all of which is reflecting underlying deep racial and socioeconomic divides. And so, Dr. Galea, how do we go about solving this structurally 
from a health perspective because all of these things, and I think you've pointed this out to us before, rightly, are all intertwined, whether it's health, education, transportation, housing, all of it is tied together. But just taking health and, and your specialty and, and public health specifically, what are the ways that, that maybe we can be thinking about uh, to start to change the structure of this? Yeah, I think uh, it's a, I think it's a great question, Jason. I think it's a, it's a natural question, and I suppose I would invert the question because mm-hmm. I do I do not think you can treat this just as a health problem. Interesting. I think that health is ineluctably linked with housing, with fair, fair wages, with gender equity, with clean air, drinkable water, with the way we structure our society overall, and this is why health and social justice are so inextricably intertwined because there is no solution that focuses only on health. If we focus only on health, what ends up happening is we end up burrowing and burrowing more, ever more deeply in spending money on healthcare. And of course, spending money on healthcare, as as you know, as the listeners know, is treating disease after people are already sick. Right. But of course, people are getting sick to begin with because of these underlying issues. And let's take let's take one concrete example. Let's take the economic collapse that has happened after COVID. We all we all know this. You talk about it quite a bit in your show. But of course. The economic collapse has been uneven. I mean, 36 million jobs have been uh, lost so far, and 40% were held of the jobs lost were held by people who already had an annual household income of below 40,000. The unemployment rate among whites is 14%, among blacks 17%, among Latinx populations 19%. So what we're seeing here is even in something like this, which is an economic collapse, which is widespread, which you report correctly has been widespread, is furthering these divides. And these are the social divides that are going to become health divides. So let's take for a second, let's, let's assume, let's agree that unemployment results in bad health. That's, that's not a controversial, that's not a controversial right. statement, right? So I'm telling you unemployment results in bad health. I'm also telling you that unemployment is disproportionate among people who are already poorer than people who are richer. So it doesn't take uh, sort of too many logical steps to realize that that means that people who are poorer are going to get sicker, people who are richer are going to get healthier. Now, if we focused on that as a strictly health problem, we are going to be throwing money at healthcare to help fix people who have gotten sick. Well, the problem, the reason they got sick to begin with is because they were already economically marginalized and because they became unemployed in a time of COVID. So when you see it that way, the two are inextricable. And I think a health agenda has to include an economic agenda. I totally agree. God, we were talking about this a lot over the weekend about what Mm -hmm. it is to those that are more vulnerable and economically disadvantaged. What do we need to do to really make a difference. We're going to we're going to continue this conversation because I know uh, Dr. Galea you have a lot more on this and I want to probe a little bit more. Um, we're going to continue with Dr. Uh, Sandra Galea, Dean and Professor at Boston University School of Public Health, author of Pained Uncomfortable Conversations about the public's health. You know, you do wonder Jason, right? Like we talk about how they're all so connected, but what's yeah. what's what's the one thing that is going to change the trajectory for let's just be quite honest, for black Americans. What's yeah. going to change it? You know, and you can't just keep throwing money at whether it's education or health care. Um, we've really got to figure out what makes a big difference. Yeah. And how do you essentially remake the system? It's not about fixing the system. It, it really is about rebuilding it in many ways from the ground up. How do you do that in a way that doesn't, it isn't so disruptive that you end up hurting a lot of people in the process? And it's a complicated one for sure. We're going to continue that conversation in just a second. You are listening to Bloomberg Business Week right here on Bloomberg Radio. This is a Bloomberg Money Minute. Economic optimism continues to fuel Wall Street's rally. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is up 309. The S&P is up 24. The Nasdaq up 70. New York is taking baby steps as it reopens from its COVID-19 lockdown. Some small retailers are opening their doors, even as bigger ones hold back. The director of retail studies at the Columbia Business School says smaller businesses may feel a more urgent need to reopen. WeWork may abandon its push into communal living as it returns to its co-working routes. Sources say WeWork is in talks to hand over its We Live location near Washington, D.C., and is considering options for a second location in New York. February marked the end of the record-long U.S. expansion. The National Bureau of Economic Research, which serves as the arbiter of U.S. business cycles, made it official in an online announcement today. Larry Kofsky, Bloomberg Radio. 
Okay, kids, dad's gonna teach you how to dance. First, spread your feet apart. Then, a pump your knee, a nod your head, shake your hips, and bite your lip ever so slightly. Now, with one hand in the air, point at people with the other hand. I call that the rock star. Dance like a dad. It's a great way to make a moment with your kids. Now, make a face like it just smells something bad. Visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. In-depth analysis, concise reporting, need-to-know global business news. Around the world and across the markets, Bloomberg connects the dots for decision makers. Stay on top of today's headlines. Follow big breakthroughs in tech. Understand the latest political issues. See how the world's wealthiest are spending their money. Track what's happening in the markets and much more. Subscribe today to Bloomberg, the global standard for business reporting. Get it all at Bloomberg.com slash subscriptions. COVID-19. You know that feeling when you get more than you expected? Like discovering that the box of chocolates has a whole other layer underneath? Or scoring extra poppadoms with your takeaway? Or joining Tesco Mobile and finding out you get the latest phones and 99% UK network coverage? Yeah, that moment. Feels good, right? Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. 99% 4G population coverage indoors and outdoors across UK. There's a reason flash storage is called flash storage and not electronic non-volatile computer memory storage. From quick and efficient data retrieval to instant scalability, everything about IBM flash storage is fast. It's also cloud-ready and surprisingly affordable, with a recommended monthly price of £310 for 24 terabytes of all flash. Order by the 30th of June and pay nothing for 90 days. Find out more at ibm.biz slash flash offer. With the NHL season temporarily on ice, now is a good time to catch up on past games. With Game Replay on TuneIn, you can listen to every power play, slap shot, and goal of the 2019-2020 season so far. Suter to Conan to Fiala. He scores! And for a limited time, it's free for hockey fans everywhere. Search Classic Game Replays to start listening. Want to relive the glory of college football? Balls over a man into the end zone. The end zone. Come explore TuneIn's classic game replay collection to hear ESPN's complete coverage of the 2019 New Year's Six Bowl games. Don't miss your chance to re-experience the Rose Bowl, the 2020 National Championship featuring Clemson and LSU. There are going to be two champions on the field tomorrow night. There's going to be one team hold up the trophy. Ten, Search Classic Game Replays to listen for free. Did you know that with TuneIn's local radio feature, you can stream live FM and AM stations broadcasting in your area? Discover local news, talk, and music stations. Navigate to the local radio section under Browse to listen locally on TuneIn. Hey, y'all, we're taking the Marty Party to a whole new level with the Marty Smith's America podcast with Gerald McCoy. I truly believe that Carolina made a mistake. Like Jam, though. This is not a personal shot at Teddy Bridgewater. This could have been Andy Dalton. This could have been whoever they brought in. Cam has so much left. Somebody's really getting a great one, man. And they don't, I don't think people really understand what they're getting. Search Marty Smith America to listen. In case you didn't know, TuneIn lets you listen to the same radio stations you pick up on your home or car radio, except you can hear them from anywhere. If you want to find a station from somewhere else in the world, navigate to the By Location section under Browse. Keep exploring with TuneIn. Looking for your daily fix of NFL news and analysis? In that. So we had to blow it up with the Super Bowl predictions instead. Look no further than the Pick 6 Podcast, where CBS sports writer Will Brinson gets you up to speed with what's trending in the NFL that day so that you're always in the know. Yeah, it's pretty revealing of Brinson's methodology for predictions. When he gets mad at people for predicting good teams are going to win the Super Bowl or good players are going to win major awards, that's how you wind up. Search Pick 6 on TuneIn to listen. Are you fully informed on the NBA? 
the NBA Hangtime Podcast, veteran sports writers Seku Smith and John Schumann analyze the latest NBA news, storylines, and discussions with guests from around the basketball universe. Well, Isaiah Thomas joined us here on the Hangtime Podcast. Isaiah, uh, good morning. Everybody's doing well. As you know, my daughter's had this podcast. Search NBA Hangtime on TuneIn to listen. Live to New York, Bloomberg 1130, to Washington, D.C., Bloomberg 991, to Boston, Bloomberg 1061, to San Francisco, Bloomberg 960, to the country, Sirius XM Channel 119, and around the globe, the Bloomberg Business app and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Well, coming up, we're going to continue our conversation with Dr. Sandro Galea up at Boston University. Uh, Very timely and someone that really has some nice prescriptions for where we might want to go from here. See what I did there? Yeah, very nicely done. Yeah, I want to know about specific steps, too, because I want to figure out. We've all talked about this a lot, but I want to see what he thinks. is one of those first steps to make a difference. All right, let's get back to your top business stories and an update on that rally. Here is once again, Charlie Pellet. Hi, thank you very much. 15-week high. Speaking of prescriptions, two drug makers behind the industry's most prominent responses to the COVID-19 pandemic are looking into the possibility of a combined future as economies emerge from lockdowns. Sources tell Bloomberg London-based AstraZeneca, co-developer of one of the fastest-moving experimental coronavirus vaccines, has made a preliminary approach to Gilead. At Sciences, maker of the only American-approved treatment. If they decide to pursue a merger, it would rank as the biggest deal ever in the sector. As for shares of both companies, they are trading mixed right now. AstraZeneca down 2.2%. Gilead is up by 7 tenths of 1%. The Dow, the S&P, NASDAQ, they are all rallying today as uh, economies begin to reopen, specifically New York. Right now, the Dow Jones Industrial Average is up 200. 98 points, up 1.1 percent. S&P is up 23, up 7 tenths. NASDAQ up 72. That is a gain there of 7 tenths of 1 percent. Tenure up 9.30 seconds, looking at the yield right now of 0.86 percent. Gold up 8 tenths of 1 percent. 16.99 the ounce and a 3.5 percent drop today in West Texas Intermediate Crude, now at 38.17 a barrel, down by 1.4 percent. A major area of concern for health professionals monitoring the spread of coronavirus has been massive demonstrations across the country in recent days. Dr. Joshua Sharfstein is vice dean at the Bloomberg Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. I'm just saying generally that, okay, we're now moving past coronavirus, but we can't move past coronavirus because the virus is still there and still has the same logic that it always had. So whether we're, you know, um, protesting, which I think people are protesting the right things, you know, it's incredibly important, or whether we're, you know, doing other things, whatever it is, um, you know, we have to have the coronavirus in mind to keep it as safe as possible. Sources tell Bloomberg Occidental Petroleum is reviewing options for its Middle Eastern assets as it seeks ways to reduce its debt pile. Stock is now at a three-month high. Shares of Occidental Petroleum up today by uh, roughly 18%. Again, recapping equities surging. S&P up 24, a gain there of eight-tenths of 1%. I'm Charlie Pellet. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie, thanks for the update. Our guest at this hour is Dr. Sandro Galea. Uh, Galea. He is dean and professor at Boston University School of Public Health, author of Pained, Uncomfortable Conversations about the Public's Health. Uh, Dr. Galea, one thing I want to ask you, since we, you know, we know so much is interconnected uh, in terms of, you know, really determining what kind of life an individual in America has. So what do you think is the most important, difficult conversation that we have to have at this point? Is it over housing? Is it transportation? Is it wages? Is it taxation? Is it health? What's the one that we need to have to kind of make a difference to the less fortunate populations? And specifically, since we've talked about it a lot over the last couple of uh, weeks and certainly the last 13 weeks, the black population. Yeah, Carl, I, I think that's a, that's a terrific question and one I'm asked all the time. And is it, is it a conversation about making sure everybody has access to quality early childhood education? Is it a conversation about fair wages and increasing minimum wage? Is it a conversation about affordable housing, about ensuring that everybody has food, about narrowing wealth gaps, about reducing violence of in marginalized groups and CBD groups? And the answer is, I don't know that any of these are important than others. I actually think the hardest conversation is the one 
we're having now, which is to say that all of these conversations are important. You know, which of these conversations become policy solutions depends as much on the conversation as it does on the pragmatics of the moment as to on what is possible in what jurisdiction. So as far as I'm concerned, if there is one thing that we should do, it's to change the conversation and to say that all of these are forces that we should discuss in the same breath as we discuss health. And when you think about COVID, and I ask myself, you know, what shall we look back on COVID in 10 years' time? What's the conversation that we should remember? What I'd like us to remember is that COVID taught us that you cannot health, have a healthy country without better education, transportation, wages, housing, food, narrowing wealth gaps, reducing violence, better integration of marginalized groups, because all of those forces we have seen play out in creating the COVID pandemic that we've lived through. So if we learn from that, if we learn from that, we will tackle them and tackle them now. And, you know, I do wonder, Dr. Galea, part of this is educating maybe the next generation, whether it's the next generation of doctors or just the next generation writ large, in sort of a different way or to think in a different way. And that seems to be coming up repeatedly. And I think many of us are buoyed by the fact that a lot of the people protesting peacefully are of many different races and, and colors mm-hmm. and backgrounds. Um, I do wonder what the conversations are that you're having with your students and how they might be different from a previous generation. Yeah, I, I, I like you. I'm uh, I'm uh, by, uh, by thinking about the next generation. One of the privileges of being a dean of a school is I'm surrounded by the next generation. I uh, All of these conversations are happening with our students, but perhaps most importantly, our students are leading the conversations because I actually think that uh, the uh, generation that is um, up and coming that will be in charge of the world in the next 20 years has some interesting ideas. And I don't think all of those ideas work. I think some I agree with, some I disagree with. But I think it's um, it's a tremendously important moment in time to allow ideas to fight space so that we can which sift forward, which ones we can adopt, and to use, I think, something Carol said before the break, how we can make sure we actually implement the transformations we need yeah. to implement without and making sure that people are not hurt in the process. And, and that and that of course is critical. So I've been I've been enjoying listening and learning from uh, the ideas emerging from uh, the next generation. And of course it, it's immensely hopeful to think that uh, some of these concepts that the three of us are discussing, they're sort of second nature to the generation that's right. uh, up and coming. Right. And, and that will make the world a better place. I, I was thinking about I know Jason you do this at your home with your teenagers and my teenager too. Like the way they talk about this and approach it may, gives me hope, I have to say, in terms of totally. you know, the possibility of, of making a difference and looking at it in a different way. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Sandro uh, Galeo. Uh, Galea, he is dean and professor at Boston University School of Public Health, uh, author of Pained, Uncomfortable Conversations About the Public Self. And he's so patient because every time I say his name, I seem to just mess it up. And he's just such a gem. <laughs> New in different ways. I know. <laughs> I feel so terrible because i he's one of my favorite voices to talk to because I feel like he looks at the world. It's not just health care, but it's taking everything into account. And how do you make a difference? Maybe in all of our show calls, we'll just say, all right, let's say it again, Sandro Galea. Sandro Galea. <laughs> Uh, I think it's Sandro Galea. Sandro Galea. I know. I don't know what it Just is. Just got some work to do. Listen. <laughs> don't we, we all, all have work to do. We all have work to do. <laughs> all right. Let's list. get back to Nancy Lyons now. She's got world and national headlines down in the nation's capital. Hey, Nance. Hey, Jason. A judge has set bail of $1 million for the Minneapolis police officer charged with second-degree murder in George Floyd's death. Derek Chauvin said almost nothing during the 11-minute hearing in which he appeared on closed-circuit television from the state's maximum security prison. Well, hundreds of mourners are waiting to pay their respects to George Floyd in Houston. Texas Governor Greg Abbott is among those attending today's final public viewing. Today is a sad day. Ever since his death has been a sad day. Floyd's funeral will be held tomorrow in Houston. New York, the hardest hit U.S. city in the coronavirus pandemic, is slowly reopening. It's day one, and subway and bus service is ramping back up. MTA CEO Pat Foy tells Bloomberg all riders, though, do need to wear a mask. We got a million masks donated by the state and the city each. Uh, we've got MTA employees and volunteers uh, from both the state and the city and the MTA helping distribute those masks. So the most important action that can be taken by our customers is wearing masks. We're going to monitor it and report it going forward. So far, compliance is at 92 percent. 
Stores previously deemed non-essential are now doing delivery and curbside pickup, though customers cannot yet browse inside. Construction, manufacturing, and wholesalers have also received the go-ahead. Philadelphia officials say they're seeing a spread of coronavirus cases from recent Jersey Shore beach parties held at beach homes. Bucks County officials say 12 cases have been traced to one resident who went to those gatherings. The county's health director says it's a reminder you should not let your guard down at the beach. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Nancy Lyons. Business is constantly evolving. Is your financial printer evolving to keep ahead of the curve? At Command Financial, we are redefining financial printing by providing industry-leading expertise, leveraging technology, and honing processes and best practices. Every day, Command helps SEC registrants, as well as members of their working groups, including securities attorneys and investment bankers, prepare, file, and disseminate regulatory and disclosure documents, such as registration statements, M&A documents, and mutual fund prospectuses and reports. Command provides a full range of services to help you effectively complete your deal, meet your disclosure requirements, and achieve your shareholder communications objectives. Visit our website at commandfinancial.com and learn how we're evolving, not only with the times, but also with your business requirements. Command Financial, redefining financial printing. For the Jewish Communal Fund, Noel Spiegel, former senior partner with Deloitte & Touche and past JCF president, discusses the advantages of a donor-advised fund over a private foundation. There's a lot involved in having a private foundation. You need to engage attorneys, you need to engage accountants, file tax returns. At JCF, all of that is done for you. You don't have to get involved in anything other than making your contribution to your fund and then determining which grants that you want to make. A JCF fund may be opened with a minimum $5,000 contribution of cash or appreciated securities and can be used as an alternative to or to get with a private foundation. If you have a foundation, you have to list all of the contributions that you made. Potentially, anybody, because the information is public, can find out exactly which organizations a foundation has made charitable contributions to. Let JCF simplify your philanthropy and protect your privacy. Learn more about JCF's private client group at jcfny.org. If knowledge is power... This is a message from the government about the next stage of controlling coronavirus with NHS Test and Trace. To protect your friends and family, testing and tracing must become a new way of life. If you have symptoms, you need to get a test immediately. Don't leave home for any other reason. If you test positive, we will contact you to trace people who you might have infected. From now on, if you're told you've been exposed to an infected person, you must self-isolate for 14 days. Play your part and do the right thing so we can safely return to a more normal life. Go to nhs.uk or call 119. Stay alert. Control the virus. Save lives. The force is strong in my family. My father has it. I have it. You have that power too. For the first time ever, stream the complete Skywalker saga all in one place. Nine incredible films, one epic story, only on Disney+. Plus. The Force will be with you, always. The Skywalker Saga, on Disney+. Plus. Now streaming, 18-plus subscription required. T's and C's apply. Who says you can't have a laugh while getting serious about America's pastime? <laughs> on the daily podcast, Locked on MLB, comedian and baseball fanatic Paul Francis Sullivan talks about each team, each pennant race, and everything else in the game. From rule changes and controversies to baseball cards and stadium food. For those of you who are not familiar with me or the old show, I love to obsess over baseball. I'm talking baseball over the Super Bowl. We had a TV show in the Division Series during my wedding. Search Locked On MLB on TuneIn to listen today. Let's be honest. We all spend too much of our day on social media. But at least you can spend your endless scroll time to discover new things on TuneIn. Follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to always be in the know about the best new stuff streaming in the app. From breaking news stories and live sporting events he does! Every to standout stations and podcasts, stay in touch with TuneIn. 
Want to relive the glory of college football? Balls over a man into the end zone. The end zone. Come explore TuneIn's classic game replay collection to hear ESPN's complete coverage of the 2019 New Year's Six Bowl games. Don't miss your chance to re-experience the Rose Bowl, the 2020 National Championship, featuring Clemson and LSU. There are going to be two champions on the field tomorrow night. There's going to be one team hold up the trophy. Ten, to the five, touchdown! Search Classic Game Replays to listen for free. You love TuneIn for live-breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on-demand news shows on TuneIn. In case you didn't know, TuneIn lets you listen to the same radio stations you pick up on your home or car radio, except you can hear them from anywhere. If you want to find a station from somewhere else in the world, navigate to the By Location section under Browse. Keep exploring with TuneIn. Wanna bet football can make you feel nostalgic? Playing days are over, so... On the podcast, NFL Alumni Lounge, Charlie Booth sits down with retired NFL legends to talk about their careers, life after football, and everything in between. Sit down, Walla. Good to have you. Yes, sir. It's good to be here. Dana White, welcome to the Alumni Lounge. Thanks for having me, brother. Big member of our NFL alumni family, the CEO of the XFL, Mr. Oliver Luck. Charlie, good to see you. Thanks for having me. We're here with the president, Mr. Eric Price. Good to see you. Search NFL Alumni Lounge on TuneIn to listen. Four hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. At Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. 15-week high for the S&P 500 index. The dollar fell as easing lockdowns bolstered economic optimism. The S&P 500 index uh, close to the best level of the day right now, up 24 points, up 8 tenths of 1%. The Dow is up 320, up 1.2%. NASDAQ is up 72. That is a gain of seven tenths of one percent tenure up six thirty seconds zero point eight seven percent gold up eight tenths of one percent sixteen ninety eight the ounce and west texas intermediate crude down three point three percent thirty eight twenty five a barrel apollo apollo globals josh harris and blackstone's david blitzer are exploring a possible acquisition of the mets this according to variety citing people familiar with the matter again recapping equities rallying 15 week high on the s p up 20 25 right now at 32.19, up eight tenths of one percent. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. You are listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Jason Kelly and Carol Masser here with you on a Monday afternoon. And, you know, one of the issues that we have been looking at so closely, uh, Carol, is. Uh-huh. What happens next and how we got here? And this story from the magazine last week, I think, is a really important, and I'm really glad uh, Joel Weber and I were talking about this earlier, that we're getting a chance to talk about it. Claire Suddeth wrote it, uh, and the story has a very simple headline. America's safety net is failing its workers. Claire joins us on the phone from Brooklyn. Joel Weber is also with us, the aforementioned Joel Weber. He is the editor, of course, of Bloomberg Business Week. So, Joel... Help us understand how this fits into what was clearly a broader theme in the magazine, in the most uh, recent issue of the magazine. So Claire actually started working on this story basically right at the very beginning of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I think she really, uh, she's just like one of the most gifted storytellers I think we have. And really, I think she was like a laser on putting, um, uh, you know, the spotlight on workers and one after the next that she talked to, uh, she was just getting amazing stuff about them basically realizing how there was no more safety net in this country because it's basically just been eroded over time. So when something like the pandemic hits, everything is overwhelmed and as a result, the labor market just goes upside down. And frankly, even despite Friday being what those numbers were, it still feels like we still don't understand entirely what's going on. And I think Claire's reporting to me of everything I've read so far was the one that just made me really understand it on a more human level. Uh, Claire, what did you? How did you find these people, and, and what did you hear from them? Um, that is a great question. I found them a number of ways. Um, I mean. Part of this is this whole story, given the pandemic, had to be reported remotely. Um, So normally I try to go out and talk to people, but here I basically utilize the Internet. I 
put out a call on pretty much all social media that I could. And then I also just reached out to random small business owners. Um, I read something small in the paper about um, Cheesecake Factory employees being furloughed and that they had formed this Facebook group. So I talked my way into the Facebook group and ended up talking to all these Cheesecake Factory employees. So there's an anecdote about them in there. Um, and it was just a lot of, I would refer to it as on the ground reporting, except it's more like on the internet reporting. Um, <laughs> on the Zoom reporting. To, <laughs> yeah. And I tried to talk to people all over the country. So there are people from, you know, Virginia to Chicago to California to Montana to New Mexico to Texas in the story um, to paint a pretty wide picture of what it looks like across America as a whole. And and what, is, what did you okay. learn? Uh, I learned, so I, I, did, I started reporting this before the CARES Act passed. Um, so the thing that struck me first is people were getting laid off during the shutdown, the initial couple first weeks in March, was that um, given the past work that I have done on stuff similar to this, I just knew that there wasn't anything available for a lot of people. And many people have extreme debt um, or their health care is tied to their jobs or they don't have health care at all. And so I wanted to see what this looks like when you suddenly are laid off of work um, with no opportunity really to get another job. I think what was different with this pandemic is if you're laid off in a recession, it sucks and it's terrible, but you can look for other jobs. But if you're, if you're a restaurant worker and your restaurant closes, you can't go to another restaurant. So you had to sit tight. Um, and so I watched as these people went from having um, no safety net whatsoever, the the, the very first people in the story happened to be working. They were freelance workers, and they happened to be working the first sporting event in the U.S. that was shut down um, on March 8th, and they had nothing. They had um, they paid for their own health insurance. They didn't have, you know, any unemployment. They didn't qualify. The CARES Act later changed that, but it took them a month plus to actually get, up, you know, through the unemployment system, which is you know, it has its own issues. And so I started talking to them before they could even apply for unemployment and thought that they had to do this all on their own. And then this act gets passed and then they feel better. And then it turns out that they have to wait for their unemployment and then it's not what they thought it was going to be. You know, one of them didn't even get anything until just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and they have been laid off since March. So that's basically the story of why we didn't have this set up in the first place. And then um, what uh, a cluster mess it is to try to build a safety net in the middle of a pandemic. Right. Well, you know, what's first of all, I love that you tell the personal stories because I feel like sometimes we, we talk from that big perspective, the big broad numbers, but when you really hear about, you know, the struggles that so many Americans are going through as a result of this, it's really very telling. The thing is, what's interesting, Claire, too, about your story is the destruction of the middle class, right? You know, we see people pointing like, you've got to have a safety net. net. But how can you have a safety net when we really destroyed, I feel like, that opportunity for so many Americans? Yeah, you know, I talk to people at, in all different levels of um, what I would, I guess, refer to as, you know, economic and financial security. And, um, you know, there's a woman in the story who was a senior marketing manager at Airbnb. Like, she made good money. She worked for a big company. Um, she's getting severance through um, July. Um, but the thing is that she lives in the Bay Area, and she had, you know, had, I think it was about $45,000 in personal debt. And she can't afford to stay in the Bay Area if she can't find another job. And she's not sure that she's going to be able to do that before her severance ends, um, which is, you know, she has like maybe a month to go before, mm -hmm. she, you know, and she doesn't yeah. have a job. And so her option is essentially she's 40 years old and she's originally from New Jersey. And so she said, I'm just going to move home to New Jersey and live with my mom. Um, and this is a woman who's, you know, well advanced in her career is doing well in all other respects, but um, just the nature of life and how expensive it is, the middle class, I talked to several economists who study this and study wealth disparity, and one of the things, um, um, Edward Wolf at NYU mentioned that he's been studying this for so long. In the 1980s, your average middle class family had enough financial reserves and savings to get through two to three months of just sort of normal consumption if they hold tight, if they lose their jobs. 
and now it's a little bit over a week, which is <sighs> nothing. Yeah, yeah, that's really remarkable. Yeah. Well, uh, it is a must-read for sure. It was one of the most read uh, when it published last week, and certainly this whole issue of the magazine is one to really sit with and mm-hmm. kind of take it in because I think we all need that gut check and that reality check about what the statistics, the data, and the personal stories, and you pointed that out, Carol, really show. But I also think of the conversation we have with Dr. Galea, right, about all of this so interconnected, totally. right? And we've got to, if we're going to solve some of these problems, folks, we have to look at all of it. Education, housing, wages, so much. So our thanks to Claire Suddeth. Uh, check out that story in the magazine. And of course, our thanks always to Bloomberg Business Week editor, Joel Weber. All right. For those of you listening in New York, D.C., and San Francisco, watching on YouTube, Bloomberg Business Week is going to continue right here. Stephen Skanky coming up with us. He worked in the Treasury. He's going to help us understand everything that's going on when it comes to jobs and look forward to the Fed. If you're listening on Bloomberg 106.1, in Boston, Bay State Business. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg. At the start of every day, this is a message from the government about the next stage of controlling coronavirus with NHS Test and Trace. To protect your friends and family, testing and tracing must become a new way of life. If you have symptoms, you need to get a test immediately. Don't leave home for any other reason. If you test positive, we will contact you to trace people who you might have infected. From now on, if you're told you've been exposed to an infected person, you must self-isolate for 14 days. Play your part and do the right thing so we can safely return to a more normal life. Go to nhs.uk or call 119. Stay alert. Control the virus. Save lives. Dear Dad, Happy Father's Day. You are my rock, my go-to guy. Whenever I call, you're happy just to listen. You've always been there for me, by my side. I don't know how you put up with my people playing all those years. Hang on, kiddo. I'll listen in a sec. I miss you. See you soon. Love you lots, Luz. This Father's Day, send love straight to Dad's door with moonpig.com. Download the app today. Want to relive the glory of college football? Balls over a man into the end zone. The end zone. Come explore TuneIn's classic game replay collection to hear ESPN's complete coverage of the 2019 New Year's Six Bowl games. Don't miss your chance to re-experience the Rose Bowl, the 2020 National Championship featuring Clemson and LSU. There's going to be two champions on the field tomorrow night. There's going to be one team hold up the trophy. Yeah, Search Classic Game Replays to listen for free. You love TuneIn for live breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on-demand news shows on TuneIn. With the NHL season temporarily on ice, now is a good time to catch up on past games. With Game Replay on TuneIn, you can hear every matchup of the 2019-2020 season so far. And for a limited time, it's free for hockey fans everywhere. Search Classic Game Replays to start listening. Looking to freshen up your listening on TuneIn? Head to the homepage to discover something new. There you'll see custom recommendations based on your listening habits, along with new episodes of shows you've enjoyed in the past. Uncover your next audio obsession on the homepage. Want to bet football can make you feel nostalgic? Playing days are over, so... On the podcast, NFL Alumni Lounge, Charlie Booth sits down with retired NFL legends to talk about their careers, life after football, and everything in between. This is Darren Waller. Good to have you. Yes, sir. It's good to be here. Dana White, welcome to the Alumni Lounge. Thanks for having me, brother. Big member of our NFL alumni family, the CEO of the XFL, Mr. Oliver Luck. Charlie, good to see you. Thanks for having me. We're here with the president, Mr. Eric Price. Good to see Search you. Search NFL Alumni Lounge on TuneIn to listen. Four hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Radio. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. We move into the final hour of trading with the Dow, the S&P, and NASDAQ all surging, building on Friday's gains. 15-week high right now for the S&P 500 index at 32.20, up 26 points, up by 8 tenths of 1%. Big question, uh, where will we close and will we remain flat for the year? Right now, the S&P is down so far this year by 3 tenths of 1%. NASDAQ is up by 10.3%, while the Dow in the 
year-to-date column is down 3.9 percent. Ten-year up 4.30 seconds with a yield of 0.88 percent. Gold up eight tenths of one percent, 16.99 the ounce. And West Texas Intermediate crude down three and a half percent, 38.19 a barrel. It is official. The record-long U.S. expansion ended in February, according to NBER. That's the academic panel that serves as the arbiter of America's business cycles, putting an official date on the start of the coronavirus-induced recession. Now, what about the economic outlook for the rest of the year? John Sylvia is the founder of Dynamic Economic Strategy. It was much more than the virus. It was the shutdown in America that really led to uh, such significant job losses. I suspect that, yes, I revised up my numbers. I'm looking for a still... 7% 7% unemployment rate by the end of 2021. So uh, we got a long way to go here, and it's definitely not a V-shaped recovery for workers. The U.K. is pressing ahead with a two-week quarantine on international arrivals, a move British Airways and others say will wipe out tourism over the crucial summer season and destroy any chance of a quick recovery from the virus-induced slump. Airline stocks, for the most part, are trading higher today. The ADRs of IAG are up 4.8 percent. As for some of the U.S. stocks, U.S. airline stocks, the big four, UAL up 10 percent, American Airlines Group up 6.9 percent. Delta up uh, 6.2 percent, Southwest up by 4.6 percent. Again, recapping equities higher, S&P up 26, up 8 tenths of 1 percent. I'm Charlie Pellet. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Jason Kelly on Bloomberg Radio. All right, you are listening to Bloomberg Business Week. It is Monday. I'm Carol Masser, along with my co-host Jason Kelly. So, Jason, we call you Kermit the Frog. <laughs> it is so true. So wavy. My family has another description of it too at here at home, but we'll talk about that later. Um, Jason, let's not forget we've got a Fed meeting this Wednesday, yes. so it's going to be very interesting. If you think about Friday's jobs report, I am so curious what the Fed has to say in today's Business Week economics. I'm so delighted to have back with us Stephen Skanky. He's chief economic advisor. At Keel Point, former U.S. Treasury, uh, um, U.S. former, sorry, former U.S. Treasury and White House National Security Council staff member. It's terrible when I can't even read my own notes. Based in Washington, D.C., he's on the phone in the nation's capital. Um, Stephen, so great to have you back with us. Um, so much going on as well. And I do wonder, first of all, how is your world? Well, thanks, uh, Carol. Always great to be with you and Jason. Uh, our, our world is uh, increasingly complicated uh, mm. just because there's so much going on all the time. But I'd say generally, well, we feel good about what we're seeing and about how markets are responding. Uh, some of it is, uh, is a little bit hard to fathom when markets are up on days that we have uh, negative news. Mm-hmm. But clearly, they've, uh, they've learned to look forward to what's coming and not what's in the rearview mirror. Yeah, I mean, it is sort of remarkable to, to see this and to continue to try and synthesize sort of Wall Street, Main Street, data, market sentiment, and all that. So, Stephen, if you're sitting at the Fed, you know, sitting around that virtu- that Zoom meeting, with uh, which I assume <laughs> is how they're doing everything, like we all are, um, with Jay Powell, like, What's the tone of the meeting? What are you looking at more acutely or more specifically? And and how does the conversation go? They certainly have to be uh, happy with how things are developing and how what they've done already, Mm -hmm. which was uh, uh, proactive, preemptive, uh, uh, and and done very effectively. They've got to be very satisfied with that, uh, notwithstanding uh, uh, the other things that are going on in the economy and in public health, uh, but they've really done their part and they've done it well. Uh, so, so as they see where they've they've made sure that there's enough liquidity, they've backstopped critical credit markets, uh, they've done what they can on easy monetary policy and buying longer term assets, uh, and so now it's to figure out uh, where the fine tuning has to happen. You know, so far of their 11 uh, emergency credit facilities, they've only implemented uh, three of them. Uh, It looks like they're getting ready to roll out Main Street lending, uh, which can have a huge impact. Uh, Its its potential is up to uh, uh, $850 billion, 
and uh, that'll be significant when that gets rolling. So, so they're they're looking at uh, what needs to be done next and what fine tuning needs to be done with what they've done already. So, fine tuning. What I'm curious, and you understand, um, Steve, how it all works, right? Having you know worked at the Treasury, you understand um, the workings of all of this. How does something like the last two weeks? fit into potentially a Fed discussion. I bring it up because Alan Greenspan used to talk a lot about the broader society and inequalities and so on and so forth and and just kind of looking at things. So I just do wonder, does the Fed think about policy and how it either helps or hurts kind of some of the gaps that are in our society? They think about it a lot uh, Mm. and uh, pay good attention to it, uh, uh, the Fed is the one that generates uh, income and wealth disparity numbers uh, to make sure that uh, it's well distributed uh, publicly and that policymakers are aware of it. And they, and they do it in a very uh, apolitical, uh, uh, almost mm-hmm. academic way. Mm-hmm. So the data is trustworthy, it's transparent, it's widely circulated, they talk about it. Uh, nothing, is, uh, uh, nothing is sort of kept in the background. And because it comes from the Fed, uh, it, it's right there with the highest level of credibility. Uh, Jay Powell has also been very proactive, uh, as you've probably heard him say, mm-hmm. being out in town meetings and, and meeting with minority communities and, and those parts of our society that have, uh, have not done as well over time as some of the others. Uh, and they were very pleased uh, to see... Uh, historic progress made in in income levels uh, with with some of the historically uh, less privileged minority areas, uh, and, and of course one of the one of the tragedies uh, among many within the minority communities right now is that a lot of that is rolling back right. because of course uh, uh, that's where uh, many of the joblessness uh, numbers have come from first. So, Stephen, before we let you go, I, I just got to ask you, because we are thinking so much about reopening, uh, even cautiously here in the tri-state area in New York City, specifically, what's the most important data to look at when it comes to reopening, it's even from a national or, or a regional perspective in your estimation? Probably the most important data to keep an eye on is the, is the public health data. Mm. Because at the end of the day... Uh, uh, people, uh, individuals will only be comfortable going back to work and being fully productive and being out as uh, active consumers again if they feel safe. Yeah. Uh, if they believe uh, that, uh, uh, that the government, society, workplace, uh, our state and local governments in particular are, are paying attention to the environment in which they work and shop, uh, that personal protective equipment is available, that testing and contract, contact tracing is being done efficiently. Uh, and, of course, uh, everyone is paying attention to the latest news on uh, vaccines and therapeutics, and, and that's been a big market driver over the last month. So uh, we are paying attention to uh, what's happening in the public health area uh, and, and believe that that will be the principal driver ultimately for how quickly the recovery happens right the ultimate oversight right and our expectations about it and what we kind of expect our leaders in society to take care of us um Stephen, always thoughtful and really appreciate your time steve skanky chief economic advisor at keel point former u.s treasury and white house national security council staff member joining us uh, jason once again on the phone from washington dc yeah good to uh catch mm-hmm. up with him as always very timely to say the least uh speaking of washington dc let's stay there nancy lines there with some world and national headlines. Hey, Jason. Well, bail has been set at one million to one and a quarter million for the white former Minneapolis police officer charged with murdering George Floyd. Derek Chauvin has been charged with second degree murder. He said very little during today's closed circuit court appearance. Congressional Democrats are moving to reform the nation's police departments in light of recent protests following Floyd's death. House and Senate Democrats held a moment of silence in the Capitol today before releasing their legislative package as a tribute to Floyd and others killed while in police custody. Senator Chuck Schumer says it's time to approve reforms. We are taking the first of many steps, many necessary steps, to respond 
to this national pain with bold action. The bill would remove barriers of prosecuting police misconduct. It would demilitarize police by limiting the transfer of military weaponry to state and local police departments and would also combat police brutality by requiring body and dashboard cameras. It's possible your blood type could play a role in whether you get sick from coronavirus. Bloomberg's Nathan Hager takes a look. The genetic testing giant 23andMe has been digging into its vast trove of DNA profiles to shed some light on why some people get sick from COVID-19 and others don't. Preliminary results from more than 750,000 participants suggest type O blood is especially protective against the virus. Several other studies looking at both severity of illness and susceptibility to disease have also suggested blood type plays a role. Nathan Hager, Bloomberg Radio. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. When you follow the facts... Bloomberg's been reporting on this intelligence community report. When you seek out the experts... The investment banks that Bloomberg speak to also want some relief. No matter what else is happening... It's been pretty hard to read the signals. At least you know what's real. The economic fallout from the virus risks becoming entrenched. Bloomberg Daybreak Europe, weekdays at 1 a.m. Eastern, on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business App, and BloombergRadio.com. Bloomberg, the world is listening. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. How long? How much? How many? Financial, policy, and medical experts are working on answers 24-7. What about public debt? We are listening to those experts 24-7. Is the Fed effectively widening this wealth gap with its programs? Because you want answers, too. What's the most important? The trillions in stimulus, the economy's reopening, or the infections curve bending? Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business App, and BloombergRadio.com. Bloomberg, the world is listening. Adopt US Kids presents What to Expect When You're Expecting A Teenager Learning the Lingo GOAT G O A T Acronym Stand for Greatest of All Time As in Spaghetti Sandwiches for Dinner They're My Fave Dad You're the GOAT You don't have to speak teen to be a perfect parent Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same Visit AdoptUSKids.org Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Adopt US Kids and the Ad Council are you interested in a challenging edit? You know that feeling when you get more than you expected? Like discovering that the box of chocolates has a whole other layer underneath? Or scoring extra poppadoms with your takeaway? Or joining Tesco Mobile and finding out you get the latest phones and 99% UK network coverage? Yeah, that moment feels good, right? Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. 99% 4G population coverage indoors and outdoors across UK. If you can build that flat pack wardrobe without looking at the instructions, you've still got it. If you can manage five keepy uppies on your first go, you've without question still got it. If you can toss a pancake to the ceiling and not let it hit the floor, surely you've still got it. And if you can just about fit into those jeans you bought five years ago, you've definitely still got it. Got it. Brute. Still got it. Where will 2020 take you? Somewhere where people care. About each other. About our planet. About creating a better world for everyone. And becoming the best versions of yourselves. Join a community of like-minded individuals at the University of Winchester. Make sure to accept your offer by the UCAS deadline and visit our website to find out more. See the bigger picture. Be the difference. Go to winchester.ac.uk. Hi, I'm Dan from NatWest Manchester Branch. We know life's hard right now, but if coronavirus has affected your finances, we're doing our best to make things easier. If you're a personal customer, you can request a three-month payment break if you're struggling with your mortgage, loan, or credit card. Or if you need help with an existing arranged overdraft, you can get £500 interest-free for three months. Remember... 
Every one of us is here to support you. There are lots of ways we could help. Search NatWest Coronavirus. Eligibility and conditions apply to payment breaks. Overdraft up to your agreed limit if lower than £500. This is a message from the government about the next stage of controlling coronavirus with NHS Test and Trace. To protect your friends and family, testing and tracing must become a new way of life. If you have symptoms, you need to get a test immediately. Don't leave home for any other reason. If you test positive, we will contact you to trace people who you might have infected. From now on, if you're told you've been exposed to an infected person, you must self-isolate for 14 days. Play your part and do the right thing so we can safely return to a more normal life. Go to nhs.uk or call 119. Stay alert. Control the virus. Save lives. With the NHL season temporarily on ice, now is a good time to catch up on past games. With Game Replay on TuneIn, you can listen to every power play, slap shot, and go of the 2019-2020 season so far. And for a limited time, it's free for hockey fans everywhere. Search Classic Game Replays to start listening. Wondering what to play next? Want to know what other TuneIn listeners are listening to right now? Head to the trending section under Browse to explore the most popular stations and podcasts on TuneIn today. Millions of listeners like you can't be wrong. Who says you can't have a laugh while getting serious about America's pastime? <laughs> on the daily podcast Locked on MLB, comedian and baseball fanatic Paul Francis Sullivan talks about each team, each pennant race, and everything else in the game from rule changes and controversies to baseball cards and stadium food for those of you who are not familiar with me or the old show i love to obsess over baseball i'm talking baseball over the super bowl we had a tv show in the division series during my wedding search locked on mlb on tune in to listen today and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. Stocks are surging 43 minutes to go ahead of the closing bell. Look at that 15-week high right now on the S&P 500 index. Let's head right over to the first word breaking news desk for today's afternoon call. Here he is, Bill Maloney. And good afternoon, Charlie. That's right, U.S. stocks in the green again today amid gains in energy and the <laughs> airlines. Dow's currently up 302 points. SB's gained 23. NASDAQ climbs by 71. The U.S. 10 year yield at 0.88%. WTI crude futures are down 3.5%. Gold is up 15. And transports jump 128 points. Leaders to the upside in the Dow, Boeing and Dow Inc., while Intel and 3M led to the downside. On the IPO front, Lemonade filed for an IPO. And in deal news, CNBC reported that Tiffany is not open to renegotiating their deal terms with LVMH. In other news, Dunker Brands plans to hire 25,000 workers and wrapping things up. Casey's General Stores reports after the bell. Live from the First of Breaking News Desk, I'm Bill Maloney. Charlie? Okay, I thank you very much, Bill. And to hear live breaking news over your Bloomberg type squawk SQUAWK on your terminal. I'm Charlie. Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. You are listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Well, now, as we try to do most weeks, sometimes multiple times a week, mm -hmm. because we just need his insights that much, uh, let's turn to Andy Brown, Bloomberg New Economy Editorial Director. Uh, he's got a provocative column, maybe not so provocative these days, given everything and how everything is upside down. Another lost decade is coming. Andy joins us on the phone from New Hampshire. All right, break it down for us, uh, A.B. What are you saying? Yeah, so we've, you know, the, the, the epicenter of the coronavirus has now shifted to Latin America. And uh, so the new economy, we're really focused now on what is going to be the fallout on the world's developing countries. And, you know, what we're seeing is the, the good news, if you can talk about good news in an epidemic, maybe it's best to say the, the, the less bad news is that the most dire predictions of economists and epidemiologists um, about the impact that this was going to have on the developing world just hasn't actually come to pass. Um, and that's particularly true in Africa, where the United Nations just a few weeks ago was talking about potentially more than a billion infections and three more than three million deaths and multiple famines of biblical proportions 
and, and really sort of um, creating these end of the world scenarios, and that hasn't that hasn't happened. Um, it's also, uh, I mean, right now Africa, you know, according to Johns uh, Hopkins University, which is of course you know some of the most reliable data that we have, that there's only been 150,000 infections in the whole of Africa. Uh, of course, that's lowballing the, the 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 total because Africa hasn't had widespread testing. Um, the, the the other sort of piece of, of good news, I guess, is that you know it's it's actually emerging economies that are leading the global uh, economic recovery, um, and and the countries that are performing best are the ones that have been most competent at at dealing with COVID nineteen, and that's been you know uh, by and large countries in East Asia, led by China, South Korea. Um, and Taiwan, um, which was, of course, an, an, an exemplar. So that's kind of on the on the positive side, in a sense, of of the balance. Um, you know, the, the 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 bad news is that this 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 epidemic is going to dramatically widen global uh, inequality. You know, the rich countries of the world have been able yeah. to, you know, spend tr- literally trillions of dollars on, on on stimulus, plugging income gaps for workers, plugging revenue shortfalls for companies, and you know, countries in Latin America and Africa simply haven't been able to do that. And to the extent that they can. Um, um, borrow now to um, you know to support their economies. They're having to do it at higher interest rates. So now they have this additional burden of debt. Um, you know, on top of plunging currencies, on top of failing trade, um, and that's not before we even get into sort of these other issues around long-term issues of of climate change. So. You know, the, the net net outcome um, is that you're going to have a much deeper uh, divide in, in, in the global economy between the haves and the have nots, and then even between emerging economies, between those in Africa, Latin America, and then the economies of East Asia, of course, which, which are going to be come out of this pretty well. So, net, net, you know, you are really knocking back development in large parts of the world by many, many years. Well, this is, you know, Andy, what I love about your story, it's like if you were scientists and you we're going looking at a cell and you keep going through you know smaller and smaller layers and i feel like that's what you do in terms of the virus's impact on the world right differences among developed nations then you have developed versus developing and then the more you break it down there's differences even in the developing markets you though go as far to say another lost decade is coming for emerging markets how how do you anticipate that that might play out then well, if you if you look, you know, we had a, a Bloomberg story um, today by our Bloomberg's economics team. They're talking about the Brazilian economy shrinking by six percent this year. Um, you know, other some of the other major economies in Latin America, Peru, Mexico, are predicted to shrink by similar amounts. So you could say, actually, right off the bat, we've got a decade of of, of loss growth there. Mm. Um, but for many of these countries, you know, they now they don't have the resources to invest in social infrastructure, in in education, in healthcare. Everybody's talking about you know the the the, uh, the the necessity of investing in the digital economy coming out of this. That this is going to be right. um, you know an, an an area where all countries are going to have to uh, you know pour their resources. Well, you know Latin America, Africa just doesn't have the don't the countries they don't have the capacity to do that. So hence this you know there there are some like uh, Dambisa Moyo. She was on our new economy uh, conversation series the other day. She says what well, we need for Africa is a Marshall plan. They're not going to be able to dig their way out of this on their own. They need they need massive infusions of capital, um, you know, right. from from the United States, from Europe, just as just as you had this U.S. effort to rebuild uh, Europe after the World War II. It's another thoughtful piece, and you also do wonder about, you know, where we need China maybe in all of this. They've right. spent so much money on the emerging areas um, before in totally. terms of tapping resources, but then also providing uh, money for those areas. So you do wonder um, where they should, uh, what their role should be going forward. Another provocative piece and thoughtful piece by Andy Brown, editorial director. Andy, thank you, uh, of Bloomberg New Economy, on the phone from New Hampshire. Yeah, always good to catch up with him. Yeah. And as you said, sort of peeling back the onion in many ways, but because this is a global story, but an interconnected a global story in a lot of ways. Coming up, Dave Wilson's chart of the day and his song of the day to kick off this week. 
always look forward to hearing from Mr. Wilson. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week right here on Bloomberg Radio. This is a Bloomberg Money Minute. The reopening of the U.S. economy is extending Wall Street's rally. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is up 303. The S&P is up 23. The Nasdaq up 71. The COVID-19 pandemic has devastated black-owned businesses. The National Bureau of Economic Research finds a 41% drop in the number of black-owned business owners from February to April. Immigrant business owners also fared poorly. Dunkin' Donuts needs more people. It's looking to rehire about 25,000 people, launching its first ever ad blitz focused on hiring. Dunkin' is also partnering with Southern New Hampshire University to offer employees an online college education. Apple is making it easier to buy that new iPad or Mac you've had your eye on. It's extending a 12-month interest-free offer on iPhones to include some other devices. You have to make your purchase on the Apple Card to get the perk. Larry Kofsky, Bloomberg Radio. When you went car shopping, you meant business. You ace vehicle history searches and test drives. You out salesmen to the salesman. Now you've got your wheels. If you manage that, you can get your retirement plan on track. Visiting aceyourretirement.org can help. With 401k tips and smart saving strategies, you'll have the info you need to get more for your future. Go to aceyourretirement.org because when it comes to speeding past financial challenges, you're an ace. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Bloomberg and Eaton Vance are proud to present a Boston Pop salute to our heroes. This Independence Day, the fireworks won't take place, but the orchestra's 4th of July tradition will continue. The program will feature guest artists and new music paying tribute to the heroes of the current health crisis and honoring the memories of those we have lost. Watch and listen July 4th starting at 8 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on Bloomberg Television and right here on Bloomberg Radio. You're living in a world built on science. If you can build that flat pack wardrobe without looking at the instructions, you've still got it. If you can manage five keepy uppies on your first go, you've without question still got it. If you can toss a pancake to the ceiling and not let it hit the floor, surely you've still got it. And if you can just about fit into those jeans you bought five years ago, you've definitely still got it. Brute. Still got it. This is a message from the government about the emergency measures to support the economy during the period of disruption caused by the coronavirus. To help you, your business, and your workers affected, you can apply for cash grants, business rate holidays, statutory sick pay relief packages, as well as the coronavirus job retention and self-employment income support schemes. For information, go to gov.uk forward slash business dash support now. In case you didn't know, TuneIn lets you listen to the same radio stations you pick up on your home or car radio, except you can hear them from anywhere. If you want to find a station from somewhere else in the world, navigate to the By Location section under Browse. Keep exploring with TuneIn. Ready for a -a one-of-a-kind look at the NFL? On the PFF NFL Podcast, Steve Palazzolo and Sam Munson interpret the unique stats of pro football focus to analyze the league, uncover secret superstars, and discuss which teams to watch out for in the next Super Bowl. Let's talk some football. Let's do it, Steve. All sorts of stuff. We're going to do most improved defenses around the NFL. Solomon Wilcox, our very own. He went went into some detail over at PFF.com. Most improved defenses around the NFL. Search PFF NFL on TuneIn to listen. It's tune in sports on this day. On this day in 1969, MLB legend Mickey Mantle gives his farewell retirement speech during Mickey Mantle Day at Yankee Stadium. Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, Mayor Lindsay has proclaimed today, Sunday, June 8, 1969, Mickey Mantle Day in New York City. To listen to conversations breaking down the moments just like this, search sports to be part of the discussion on TuneIn. Where do sports, culture, and basketball nostalgia collide? On their podcast, Knuckleheads, NBA veterans Quinton Richardson and Darius Miles sit down with athletes, musicians, and entertainers to get brutally honest, totally unguarded conversations about everything from current events to untold stories from the golden era of sports. Kill O'Neal. You know that, right? I tried to tip dunk all the free throw line one time. Search Knuckleheads on TuneIn to listen. 
right time with Bomani Jones. While he was gone, <laughs> Al had some kind of vote to make him the managing. You remember, he used to come up all the time in the Raiders game that he was the managing general partner. By the way, and don't forget, there was a lot going on in Munich. Yeah, you know how tired yeah, that man yeah. was to come back and find out that Al Davis had strong-armed his team from him while he was gone? Search the right time with Bomani Jones to listen. Who says you can't have a laugh while getting serious about America's pastime? <laughs> On the daily podcast, Locked On MLB, comedian and baseball fanatic Paul Francis Sullivan talks about each team, each pennant race, and everything else in the game, from rule changes and controversies to baseball cards and stadium food. For those of you who are not familiar with me or the old show, I love to obsess over baseball. I'm talking baseball over the Super Bowl. We had a TV show in the Division Series during my wedding. Search Locked On MLB on TuneIn to listen today. Broadcasting live to New York, Bloomberg 1130, to Washington, D.C., Bloomberg 991, to Boston, Bloomberg 1061, to San Francisco, Bloomberg 960, to the country, Sirius XM Channel 119, and around the globe, the Bloomberg Business app and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Coming up, Dave Wilson. He's going to be along again with his chart of the day. Interested to see what he has in store for us. Get in peak. I didn't, actually. I kind of like to be surprised on that. Okay. Surprise. Okay. We'll find out in just Surprise. a Surprise. It's Dave Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's get back to your top business stories and a check on the markets. Charlie Pella, 29 minutes to go. Indeed. Minutes to go until we get Dave Wilson's song. Day better be rocket man. That's what the stock market's doing. But first, this headline from the Bloomberg Professional Service. Federal Reserve expanding its Main Street program to lend to smaller companies. The Fed says banks, quote, can register soon and will open shortly afterwards. Taylor Brands, the owner of the men's warehouse and Joseph A. Bank Chains, is considering a potential bankruptcy after the coronavirus lockdown kept America's office workers at home, putting a damper on demand for new suits. If you're working from home, you're wearing PJs, not wearing suits. Stock surging, stocks climbing to a 15-week high. The dollar falling as easing lockdowns bolster economic optimism. We've got the Dow, the S&P, and NASDAQ all rallying right now with the S&P up 27. That is a gain of 9 tenths of 1%. The Dow up 350, up 1.3 percent. Nasdaq up 83, up by nine tenths of one percent. I'm keeping an eye on the year-to-date column on the S&P because right now it is down less than three tenths of one percent. Tenure up 4.30 seconds with a yield of 0.88 percent. We've got gold up nine tenths of one percent, 16.99 the ounce. And West Texas Intermediate crude down 3.2 percent, 38.27 a barrel. Some of the other stocks that we're watching for you today. Uh, has to do with a potential deal in the drug industry. Two drug makers, AstraZeneca and Gilead, behind the industry's most prominent responses to the COVID-19 pandemic, are looking into the possibility of a combined future as economies emerge from lockdown. Right now, we have got uh, shares of both companies trading mixed. Uh, AstraZeneca down 2.5%. Gilead out of Foster City in California. It is up now by about six-tenths of 1%. And RBC Capital Markets Analyst Mark Mahaney raising his target on Amazon to 3300 from 2700 Amazon up by about 1.5% right now at 2523 on Amazon. 333 on Wall Street. That means it is time now for the Small Business Report. Here's John Tucker. Nick Vujnovic is owner of Little Greek Fresh Grill in Tampa, Florida. His sales cratered as a result of the pandemic. Well, last Friday, he took a much-needed break only to get a call from his wife and daughter. Peaceful protests over the death of George Floyd were followed by looting. Nick, who joins us now, your business was targeted, right? My phone is just blown up with videos. Cam, the ring camera started going off at 2.30. You know, phone calls from the landlord, from the restaurant managers, and from the neighboring tenants. And basically, that uh, unfortunately, our store was looted. You were preparing to open, or did the state of Florida already let you do some degree of opening when this hit? Early on, they'd always allowed uh, pickup and delivery, uh, but we, we were, people were not in the restaurant. And about a week and a half ago, they allowed us to open the dining room to 25%. And then this week, we're up to 50%. But most customers are still just doing pickup or delivery. Now, Nick, can you estimate the damage that was caused by the looting and the vandalism? It's like ends up being like ten thousand dollars worth of the broken sign, the windows, the, the equipment, the point of sale equipment, and you know people say, "Well, you have insurance." I say, "Well, insurance only covers about half. They have deductibles, some things they won't cover, 
And so it'll probably be about ten thousand dollars. Insurance will probably cover about half of that. Nick Vujnovic, owner of Little Greek Fresh Grill in Tampa. It's a heartbreaking story. We hope things work out for you. I'm John Tucker. That's the Bloomberg Small Business Report. And we thank you, John Tucker, again, recapping here. Stocks higher, S&P up 27, up 9 tenths of 1%. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. You are listening to Bloomberg Business Week. No, no. totally what I needed for this Monday, right? Yeah, it's good. It's good. Although it reminds me, my, uh, I don't know if your daughter is into this. The the teens are super into The Office. Yeah. You know this, right? Yeah, super yeah. Super into it. Like, yeah, my yeah. son Henry has watched it. I, I can't, I'm embarrassed to say how many times he's watched it there. But there's a great uh, scene where they lip sync, uh, in one of lip-sync the episodes where they lip sync to this. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll have to check for that. I'll check out yeah. for that. Okay. That's good. Because anyway. I'm obviously not a teen and I'm not familiar with that. I should have probably watched it in the first run. Did I didn't you, watch, you didn't watch the office. I watched a little bit. I, you know, actually saw the British version, right? Yeah, a bunch okay. before the American Quick version. Quick flex, yeah. Quick okay. flex. Yeah. Sorry. Right. Okay, yeah. let's bring in Dave Wilson with his chart of the day. Great song. Who does that? Yeah, you know, sort of a one-hit wonder. A band oh. called the Human Beings. B e i n z. Oh, B e i n z. That's yep. really cool. Not absolutely. <laughs> And the funny thing is, I thought of that song, our producer Paul Brennan thought of that song, Great Minds Think Alike, or there something like that. So how does that and, work? Do you like like throw your chart out there and Paul just goes, hey, Dave, what do you think about this? Sometimes. Okay. Sometimes well, we'll I just throw it here. out yeah. there and uh, see what happens. In any that's case, it's, okay. it's a collaborative process. Okay. More me, perhaps, but that's another story altogether. But why no-no? Because, you know, that's what's happened to uh, momentum stocks. Momo, if you will. As the chart headline says, Momo is a no-no. I mean, we've seen U.S. stocks really rebound from the lows of March, no question, when you consider the S&P 500 up more than 40% from its low in March. But what's happened is that there's been a real shift in momentum within uh, the index and the broader market as well. Uh, So what the chart highlights is this Morgan Stanley U.S. Momentum Long Short Index. And so the idea is that, at least in theory, you own the shares that are rising the fastest and you bet against the shares that are falling the fastest. Well, that strategy just kind of blew up last week. I mean, to the point where this uh, index (laughs) fell 25 percent, the biggest drop since April 2000. And what happened, it's actually a compilation of two indexes. So if you look at what you would call the long side, the stuff you're owning, down 1%. Not a big deal, right? But the short side, the shares you were betting against, up 31%. It's all about, you know, the, the lagging stocks catching up in a big way. And so what's happened is this momentum trade has kind of blown up. And that's really what the, the chart shows you. And if you want to know more, folks, send me an email. I'll get it to you with the explanation that goes with it and everything I do going forward. The email address is dwilson at bloomberg.net. That's dwilson at bloomberg.net. Delicate balance there, huh? Absolutely. All right, and, Dave Wilson. Uh, it definitely got tipped over. Yeah, yeah. And, totally. and in fact, this uh, momentum gauge is falling again today. At least yeah. it was when I looked earlier on. So, you know, more of the same as the losers turn into winners, you might say. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Dave Wilson, you'll be back with us just after the close of trading here in the U.S. with your stock of the day, Carol. And uh, we're going to get to the close of trading, yes? What are you laughing about? Oh, boy. Just your little... Aside, <laughs> I know. Just like, I'm in that kind of a mood. I mean, maybe I'm just feeling, you know, I'm kind of excited that the world is, you know, New York City kind of know. getting back to I'm normal. I'm really interested to see what the next week or two holds for New York City. Well, two weeks, right? We're living in two-week increments. Yeah, that's right. Good point. All right, we're going to catch you down at the closing bell. First up, though, back to World of National News headlines. And back to Nancy Lyons. Hey, Nance. 
Hey, Carol, there is a long line outside a Houston church for the final public viewing of George Floyd. His death at the hands of police has led to worldwide protest against racial injustice. Today's six-hour viewing is expected to draw thousands. Many of those standing in line are wearing masks and T-shirts with the slogan, I can't breathe. Floyd's funeral will be held tomorrow. The officer charged in the death of Floyd appeared in court via teleconference today. Derek Chauvin's bail was set at a million to a million and a quarter million dollars. House Democrats are introducing a bill that would make it likelier to investigate and penalize police officers who use deadly force. Bloomberg's Irv Chapman has more from Washington. The bill would also prohibit chokeholds to subdue suspects. Chairman Hakeem Jeffries of the Democratic Caucus. We embrace those police officers who are in the community to protect and serve. But violent police officers, brutal police officers, abusive police officers must be held accountable. Karen Bass chairs the House Black Caucus. There is a movement that has caught fire, that is multiracial, and that has also spread around the world. The House Judiciary Committee will hold a hearing to promote the bill on Wednesday. In Washington, Irv Chapman, Bloomberg Radio. Well, White House Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany was asked today if the president is considering police reforms. He's talking through a number of proposals, no announcements on that, but he definitely, as he's noted, recognizes the horrid injustice done to George Floyd and is taking a look at various proposals. McEnany did slam efforts to defund police. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Tick Take, Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists. Jenny Liss, Jewish communal leader and philanthropist, talks about why she chose the Jewish Communal Fund for her family's charitable giving. For a lot of people, it would be the convenience factor. I don't have to track anything. If charitable giving is an important part of your life, JCF can help you organize your philanthropy with our donor-advised fund. A fund can be established with a minimum tax-deductible contribution of $5,000, make grants to your favorite charities, and JCF handles all the administration and reporting. At the year end, our board awards community grants from fees and endowment income to UJ's annual campaign. We also make gifts to specific organizations, the elderly, Holocaust survivors, the hungry. The fact that we come together as a community at the end of the year to build community, that's what makes us different. Get better at giving back. To find out more about JCF's impact, visit jcfny.org and download the giving report. JCF, we have a gift for giving. Hey, y'all, Jeff Foxworthy here. Now, if you've ever found yourself repeating the same thing over and over for 75 years, you might be Smokey Bear. Only you can prevent wildfires. That's why I'm filling in for Smokey to switch things up, because there's a lot more to say. And I should know because my grandfather was a firefighter. And one of the things he taught me is that the people that love the outdoors the most are often the ones accidentally starting wildfires. Which means always (laughs) BYOB. No, bring your own bucket to the campfire. And be extra careful with things like burning yard trimmings. Don't just walk away or chances are you might be starting a wildfire. So for the love of the outdoors, go to SmokeyBear.com to learn more about wildfire prevention. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service, your state forester, and the Ad Council. In-depth analysis, concise reporting. Where will 2020 take you? Somewhere where people care about each other, about our planet, about creating a better world for everyone and becoming the best versions of yourselves. Join a community of like-minded individuals at the University of Winchester. Make sure to accept your offer by the UCAS deadline and visit our website to find out more. See the bigger picture. Be the difference. Go to winchester.ac.uk. This is a message from the government about the next stage of controlling coronavirus with NHS Test and Trace. To protect your friends and family, Testing and tracing must become a new way of life. If you have symptoms, you need to get a test immediately. Don't leave home for any other reason. If you test positive, we will contact you to trace people who you might have infected. From now on, if you're told you've been exposed to an infected person, you must self-isolate for 14 days. Play your part and do the right thing so we can safely return to a more normal life. Go to nhs.uk or call 119. Stay alert. Control the virus. Save lives. Get your cock on with Asta. 
with Uncle Ben's rice, 250 grams for just one pound. And our butcher's selection chicken breast fillets, only three pound forty for 650 grams. Why not whack it in the wok? At Asda, we're committed to low prices every day on the quality products you need. Asda. Selected stores and lines subject to availability. Where do sports, culture, and basketball nostalgia collide? On their podcast, Knuckleheads, NBA veterans Quinton Richardson and Darius Miles sit down with athletes, musicians, and entertainers to get brutally honest, totally unguarded conversations about everything from current events to untold stories from the golden era of sports. Kill O'Neal. You know that, right? I tried to tip dunk all the free throw line one time. Search Knuckleheads on TuneIn to listen. It's tune in sports on this day. On this day in 1969, MLB legend Mickey Mantle gives his farewell retirement speech during Mickey Mantle Day at Yankee Stadium. Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, Mayor Lindsay has proclaimed today, Sunday, June 8th, 1969, Mickey Mantle Day in New York City. To listen to conversations breaking down the moments just like this, search sports to be part of the discussion on TuneIn. Did you know that with TuneIn's local radio feature, you can stream live FM and AM stations broadcasting in your area? Discover local news, talk, and music stations. Navigate to the local radio section under Browse to listen locally on TuneIn. Ready for a -a one-of-a-kind look at the NFL? On the PFF NFL Podcast, Steve Palazzolo and Sam Munson interpret the unique stats of pro football focus to analyze the league, uncover secret superstars, and discuss which teams to watch out for in the next Super Bowl. Let's talk some football. Let's do it, Steve. All sorts of stuff. We're going to do most improved defenses around the NFL. Solomon Wilcox, our very own. He went went into some detail over at PFF.com. Most improved defenses around the NFL. Search PFF NFL on TuneIn to listen. The Mina Kime Show podcast. Kevin Clark. If Josh Allen became the 10th best quarterback in football this year, they'd probably win 14 games. Am I wrong about that? No. If you as a quarterback can't win in the Bills situation right now, they should not extend you. So many teams, <coughs> Jets, do not have the information they need to evaluate their quarterbacks based on the teams they've built around. The Bills do. Listen and subscribe to the Mina Kime Show podcast. Search the Mina Kimes Show to listen. 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. At Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. We've got 13 minutes to go ahead of the closing bell. With the Dow, the S&P, and NASDAQ all rallying, stocks are extending the rally to a 15-week high on reopenings. Right now, we have got the S&P 500 index advancing by 29 points, up uh, 9 tenths of 1%, now at 3223 the Dow up 389, up 1.4 percent. Nasdaq up 86. That is a gain of about nine tenths of one percent. Ten-year up 5.30 seconds with a yield of 0.87 percent. Gold up nine tenths of one percent, 16.99 the ounce. And crude, West Texas Intermediate down 3.3 percent, 38.24 barrel. Again, recapping: S&P up 29, a gain of nine tenths of one percent. Year to date, the S&P is now down by two tenths of one percent. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a blue. Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, you're listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Master along with Jason Kelly. And we're just about 12 minutes away from the closing bell on this Monday. And we continue to see, as you just heard from Charlie Pellet, that rally uh, continuing. In fact, we're just hovering pretty much uh, off our highs of the session. But nonetheless, stocks continuing to grind higher. Amazing. It is time. I know. I know. I mean, I still, I don't know. Well, I feel like disconnect between broader world and the markets, but I also feel like it's indicative of who is in the financial markets, who's investing versus kind of the rest of the world and and some of what uh, ails us and certainly a large part of our society, Jason. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's get to the drive to the close today with Mike Chalker. He is Portfolio Manager, Senior Analyst at LM Capital Group, looking after about $4 billion. Joining us on the phone from San Diego. All right. So, Mike, we're scratching our heads as, as we continue to at this market that grinds higher. You just heard uh, Charlie Pellet break down the numbers and, and Carol uh, reference them as well. What do you make of this market? What do you see in the market and how do you account for what we see in, quote unquote, the real world and the real economy? 
Hey, good afternoon, guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you know, it really is uh, a bit of a conundrum for some. Um, for others, the, ample, the uh, answer is fairly simple, and that would be the Federal Reserve. Uh, you know, it is really the market maker uh, ever since it announced uh, the action it wanted to take back in March. And our feeling at the firm is that, and the fixed income side at least, and, and it's been echoing over to the equity side, you're having a lot of market participants try to front run um, the Fed's participation. And so if you feel like you can get in uh, the securities and the risk that you're comfortable taking, uh, and then maybe later sell those at a higher price when the Fed steps into the market, which you know, it's only just beginning to do so with its uh, primary and secondary credit facilities, then that's a great fit. Uh, you know, then we'll continue to maybe step, take a step back after that point and really see if the economy can now mimic the V recovery that the markets have had. Right? Yeah, that, well, that's interesting. And I do feel like um, a million questions here. First of all, let me ask you, since it is a Fed week, we have a Fed meeting, do you expect the Fed to continue to be really supportive? Or do you think, based on that Friday's jobs report last Friday, that they're going to maybe start to say, well, you know, we can start to back off? I mean, we've seen the back off in terms of asset purchases. But I do wonder if you think they will say more on that front. I don't think that they will. Um, it was interesting to see them back off the asset purchases. I was a little bit premature um, mm. in our view from them. I thought they would be a little bit more supportive. The jobs number on Friday, of course, was a rocket number. Um, it surprised almost everyone on the street, including us. Uh, but it does make a little bit of sense as we're beginning to reopen the economy. Uh, all these restaurants, all these small businesses that did have to lay off workers, well, now they're in a rush, right? They're in a rush to bring back as much um, employees as they need to sufficiently stay open. Now the question is, did they get them all in one foul swoop? Did they just quickly bring everybody back? And this is, you know, maybe 30 or 40% of their employee rate that they had, the retention that they had before we went to COVID. And then the question remains for the rest of the economic recovery, well, how many jobs are going to be permanently lost? Because right. there will be a significant number. There will be four, five, six, seven million, who knows, a uh, number of jobs that will not return. So how do you put money to work uh, at a time like this? And are there certain sectors that feel a, a little bit better as you synthesize all of that? And presumably, uh, Mike, as you look at a, a reopening economy, we're obviously laser focused on it here on the East Coast and especially being in and around New York City and sort of what that looks like and, and how much that will influence not just investor sentiment, but ultimately earnings and economic behavior. Right. So we've done a couple things. Um, obviously, you know, there's been an incredible rotation, um, an incredible spread compression on the credit side. And if for a minute we can just step back and talk about where rates are right now, right? So the, the, the belly and the early part of the curve, or excuse me, the front part of the curve, two and three year paper, being at, you know, low to mid 20 basis points doesn't really entice anybody on the Treasury side. You're not going to have anybody continue to think, oh, let's go ahead and buy Treasuries because we can pick up 26 basis points. Um, the risk there, the risk reward isn't, isn't worth it. So a lot of what we've been doing is taking some of that allocation, moving it to a credit name uh, that we like, and particularly as you've seen in the last week or last two weeks, the incredible steepening that's gone on in the Treasury curve, I think that's exactly the momentum and the move that the Fed wants to see. Mm -hmm. um, whether they'll say it or admit it or not, I believe there is some type of yield curve control that is happening, um, probably inadvertently, but it's working out to their favor. They want rates low, but they want a steeper curve. Um, and so for us, a great place to be is in the finance and banking sector, which we've been overweight for a good part of a year, if not more. I um, mean, we're continuing to add to those names some people that have been chasing the uh, the beaten down names like energies and cruises and airlines, we think that will end up rotating out and just further the trade moving into finance and banks as well. Hey, Mike, before we go, I, I am curious, though, when you look at some of the current events that are going on in our world, whether it's the virus, whether it's the last couple of weeks, Minneapolis, and, you know, once again, we're talking about the gaps in our society and the people who are being left behind once again. And I do wonder how you look at it with an investment eye. And I do wonder if you think about maybe some of the changes that need to come about um, and, and, and how investors specifically can really vote with where they put their investment dollars. 
Well, it's really tough. I mean, that's a really tough question. It's a really tough topic. Um, you know, I was watching a segment today about how ESG has really become part of the forefront um, in a lot of investors' minds, and particularly what's, what's happened in the past couple of days. Um, you know, I'd really like to see that, that sort of expand, right, into not just environmental, social, and governance, but, you know, particularly into the social aspect. You get a lot of people that are really concerned about their environmental exposure and you know, not being in the coal producers and such. But, you know, I think what's gone on in the past week or so really brings the, to the forefront more of the social and the social injustices. And as a money manager, it's really tough to see what we think of, you know, the top tier percent uh, of the people that make up our economy continue to succeed as asset prices rise, knowing that there is a large group of people that aren't able to participate in this because of their socioeconomic factors, and they're kind of left behind. Um, so I think really that further, it furthers the divide in our country. And, and like I said, as a manager, it is sort of a tough thing to watch. But of course, you know, our, our, our duty is to make our clients money. But um, I, really, I really do feel that there is some, some more that needs to be done um, on the ESG side and, frankly, on the policy side. But yeah, that's, a, that's a topic that we, we don't handle. We only kind of try to keep watching. <laughs> All right. Well, good to catch up with you. Thanks for the insights. Mike Tucker is Portfolio Manager and Senior Analyst for LM Capital Group on the phone from San Diego, Carol. And it does feel like we are at a moment where everyone's going to uh, have to, you know, have an answer in terms of where they allocate money um, and who they're going to invest with. It feels like, and I go back to a conversation we had last week, institutions ultimately will drive this, right? Big institutions are essentially going to say, look, you're either investing in the spirit, that not just technically, but in the spirit, not just the letter of the law, the spirit of the law, that I want you to invest in. You are representing my money. And I yeah. think individual investors will do that, too. Yeah, and I think on the consumer side, you know, more consumers who really just invest or buy you know, from companies that they think are doing the right thing and are yeah. doing the right thing will also make a difference. This is Bloomberg. With a new day comes new COVID. This is a message from the government about the next stage of controlling coronavirus with NHS Test and Trace. To protect your friends and family, testing and tracing must become a new way of life. If you have symptoms, you need to get a test immediately. Don't leave home for any other reason. If you test positive, we will contact you to trace people who you might have infected. From now on, if you're told you've been exposed to an infected person, you must self-isolate for 14 days. Play your part and do the right thing so we can safely return to a more normal life. Go to nhs.uk or call 119. Stay alert. Control the virus. Save lives. It's tune in sports on this day. On this day in 1969, MLB legend Mickey Mantle gives his farewell retirement speech during Mickey Mantle Day at Yankee Stadium. Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, Mayor Lindsay has proclaimed today, Sunday, June 8th, 1969, Mickey Mantle Day in New York City. To listen to conversations breaking down the moments just like this, search sports to be part of the discussion on TuneIn. With millions of podcasts dropping new episodes all the time, how do you keep up with all your favorites? TuneIn makes it easy. Simply head to the home screen and find your new episode section to see the latest additions. Let's be honest, we all spend too much of our day on social media. But at least you can spend your endless scroll time to discover new things on TuneIn. Follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to always be in the know about the best new stuff streaming in the app. From breaking news stories and live sporting events. Yeah, but it's unique times, I think, there's through unique circumstances and uh, we're trying to... To stand out stations and podcasts, stay in touch with TuneIn. You love TuneIn for live breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on-demand news shows on TuneIn. Where do sports, culture, and basketball nostalgia collide? On their podcast, Knuckleheads, NBA veterans Quinton Richardson and Darius Miles sit down with athletes, musicians, and entertainers to get brutally honest, totally unguarded conversations about everything from current events to untold stories from the golden era of sports. Kill, oh, 
know that, right? I tried to tip dunk all the free throw line one time. Search Knuckleheads on TuneIn to listen. Bloomberg.com on the Bloomberg Business app and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Radio. Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Bloomberg World headquarters. I'm Charlie Pellet. There you have it. Sound of the closing bell at the New York Stock Exchange. Big news right at the close. S&P 500 index is now positive for all of 2020. We have wiped out the losses. S&P surging 38 points at the close. Now at 32.32. Up today by 1.2%. And in the year-to-date column, the S&P is now showing a gain of 0.05%. Year to date, we've got NASDAQ up 10.5%. The Dow Jones Industrial Average does remain lower, down 3.4%. But again, big news, red headline on the Bloomberg there, S&P 500 index now positive for all of 2020. So the Dow, the S&P, and NASDAQ all rallied today on optimism about economies reopening, specifically New York, but across the country. And Mike Chalker, portfolio manager at LM Capital Group, moments ago, he told us if you want to look at the root cause of the rally, all about the Federal Reserve. But it is really the market maker uh, ever since it announced uh, the action it wanted to take back in March. And our feeling at the firm is that, and the fixed income side at least, and, and it's been echoing over to the equity side, you're having a lot of market participants try to front run um, the Fed's participation. The Federal Reserve, meanwhile, is expanding its Main Street lending program, which it says will be open for eligible lenders soon, allowing more companies to participate and lessening the burden on banks that create the loans. Big day for a lot of the travel names. Hilton, for example, up 2.9%. Marriott up 4.8%. Among some of the cruise stocks, Carnival Corp up 15.8%. Norwegian Cruise Line Holdings up 19.7%. Royal Caribbean up 8.2%. Tenure yield 0.87%. Again, worth recapping, S&P up 38, a gain there of 1.2%, bringing its year-to-date gain now to 0.05%. I'm Charlie Pellet. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Wow, thing. Think you move me. I got a few moves I know you'll like. and Jason Kelly on Bloomberg Radio. Well, not to pat us on the back, but we kicked off our show saying optimism is out there in the markets. And we talked about New York City opening, but man, you just look at these markets and they just seem to be looking way forward. Yeah. Uh, Jason, um, you know, certainly beyond, you know, the all of the impact of the virus. It just It's interesting to just see what Charlie just mentioned, the S&P 500 rallying to race all of this year's losses. And we did see an uptick in those last uh, few minutes of trading, but uh, we had a rally pretty much throughout the day. But anyway, it's remarkable. It's remarkable. There's no two ways about it. I mean, it totally is. And, and when you think about this notion that, and we said it last week, you know, we're a couple good days from wiping out all the losses for uh, 2020. And here we are. And you think about what has happened in the world. You think about the fact that, just to reiterate, we are at home for the 13th straight week. We have not been in our office, nor have many people been in their offices since March 13th. It was still winter. (laughs) I'm going to say, is all that, all those... uh Liquor bottles we have on our desk, they better be there when we get back. They better be there. <laughs> We're going to have a party with our Ariel team. Agami and Donnie Holloway have been watching after them for us. But you know what? I would not I would not uh, fault them for uh, maybe digging it. They've been doing some, uh, they've been little, doing some amazing work. Or so, little, exactly. Little Just every once in a while. You know, it's like you, we should have put like, you know, like the little marker on there. And, be like, and then like Tacey be like, this has been watered down. This has been watered down, guys. John Tapper. Bar Rescue. You know, they have that exactly. app that measures the alcohol. That's exactly um, right. Hey, listen, I do want to mention.
mentioned, Charlie, of course, breaking down the big numbers here, and I mentioned your top performing uh, groups, and forgive me because I think I was looking at the year-to-date totals. Year-to-date, your top performers are information tech and consumer discretionary. In fact, Infotech, which is that group of big tech names that just seem to always lead up more than 11% so far this year. But if I look at uh, what we're seeing in terms of today's trades specifically, and Dave talked about it earlier, everything's up among those uh, 11 major industry groups in the S&P. Top performer, energy at more than 4%, utilities up 2.6%, real estate up 2%, which, as Dave mentioned, in a higher or what looks to be a higher rate environment, that's uh, a little interesting. Yeah. Peculiar. Your number one gainer, just because we like to talk about it, Cody. It's Cody. <laughs> What the heck is up with that? I tell you, so just pull this up. I mean, obviously we're on the radio, so people can't necessarily do this. But if you have a Bloomberg terminal, just pull up Cody uh, Cody U.S. Equity GP and just look at the three-month chart for this thing. I mean, it is like the wonkiest chart you can imagine. Just like these like spikes and then dips and troughs and peaks. And it's just a very bizarre thing. There was no discernible news uh, today that I could see, um, but it is your number one gainer. Uh, another big gainer uh, that I noticed that I'm not sure whether you did or not it's a it's a name that we talked about constantly last year beyond me uh, oh, some yeah, big yeah. news as it relates to China I believe drove that stock higher and it was here. up 22 percent today and really trading off of this headline distribution Chinese deal with Synodis yeah. uh, is the company's name uh, so a big partnership there and obviously well, the Chinese market is it's massive. the Chinese market it's a billion plus market. consumers right yeah. this is what you know companies have been salivating over no pun intended for decades I feel like you just of- wanted to say no duh <laughs> <laughs> like, no, duh, you got a big Chinese deal. Of course, your stock is going to go up. Oh, my gosh, no, a duh. snort. Sorry, that was a snort on air. Thank you. Yes, yes, you're welcome, everybody. Um, yeah, but that's huge. And I don't know what Beyond Meat is doing for the year. Let me just take a look because, uh, oh, my God, it's up a hundred, almost 115%. Yeah, it's more than doubled this year. Yeah. Oh, did you say that? Yeah. No. Oh, okay. Um, let's also mention Norwegian Cruise because that too, we heard um, our team talking about that, uh, certainly some of the uh, cruise lines higher. That stock alone up 20% in today's session. Yeah, there you go. All right, let's take a quick look Still at- Still down 54% this year though, just going to say. There you go. Uh, volatility actually up a touch uh, today, about 5%. Uh, still trading under 30 though, it closed at 25.74. This is Bloomberg. All right, Dave, you're up. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Dave. Wilson, where are you? Wilson! Just what do you think you're doing, Dave? We're going for a price on Wilson. Open up the door, it's Dave. Who? Dave. Hey, Hey, Mr. Wilson, Dave Wilson, back with us with your stock of the day. Michaels. Indeed. The retailer whose aim is to make creativity happen. At least that's their slogan. Uh, The company sells arts and crafts, supplies, and related items at 1,273 stores in the U.S. and Canada. Michaels was founded in 1973 by a Dallas businessman named Michael Dupuy and first went public in 1984. The company was bought by Bain Capital and Blackstone Group in 2006 and taken public again in 2014. Uh, This time around, the ticker is M-I-K. Michaels fell below its initial price of $17 a share in late 2018 and kept dropping as results proved disappointing. This past March, the shares traded for as little as a dollar each. Michaels has rallied in the past two weeks, and the rebound accelerated today after J.P. Morgan put the stock on a list of top picks. The firm raised its rating to equivalent of buy from neutral and almost doubled its 12-month price estimate to $13. That's the highest of seven analysts in the Bloomberg survey. J.P. Morgan says saw a path to renewed sales growth at Michaels in the next four quarters. And to put that in perspective, sales fell 28%. In the fiscal first quarter, its stores opened more than a year. Now, J.P. Morgan's optimism about Michaels sent the stock soaring almost 59%. Wow. Biggest gain since its return as a public company. Is All it right. Just, is it, you know, like you and Jason are going to be home making scrapbooks this summer or what? Well, I was going to say it's my go-to place for all my scrapbooking needs. I do not scrapbook. I really, I'm I'm a little upset that you made that joke before I could. (laughs) Sorry. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. We love people who scrap, who make scrapbooks. Yeah. (laughs) Dave Wilson, Uh, are you there? (laughs) Did we lose you? I'm just, I have nothing to say. I'm not a scrapbook guy either. Yeah. Picture frames, maybe. Yeah. That's about as good as it gets for me. 
I'm pretty not sentimental not a about stuff, either. I will say. Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah. And it's a nice private equity story, too, uh, Michael's is. That's why I'm more interested in it, <laughs> oh to my be honest. God, really? A little private equity scrapbook. There you go. <laughs> Dave Wilson, thank you so much. We'll catch up with you again tomorrow. All right, let's head out to the West Coast. Our Baxter is there for World and National Headlines. Hey, Ed. Hi, Jason. Hi, Carol. Hey. Now, this is day one of New York's phased reopening. We are continuing our decline. The rest of the country is still spiking. How remarkable is that? Governor Andrew Cuomo announcing only 1.2% of New York staters tested yesterday were positive. He says the lowest rate since the pandemic began. Now, the rate in the city, by the way, a bit higher at 2%, but still an all-time low. Mayor Bill de Blasio hopeful on the opening day. Stick to it. Come back to work, but remember to stick to those smart rules that got us this far. President Donald Trump, after a brutal political week that saw him sink to new polling lows against Joe Biden, has seized on the defund the police movement. Spokeswoman Kaylee McEnany. The president is appalled by the defund the police movement. The fact that you have sitting congresswomen wanting to defund the police, notably Rashida Tlaib, notably Biden advisor AOC Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Now the fact of the matter is though that Joe Biden does not. He has issued a statement saying that he would not support defunding police. He says there is an urgent need for reform and that he advocates for body-worn cameras and further diversification in police forces. And the White House is signaling out New York Mayor Bill de Blasio, who has responded. We have a big, strong, effective police force. We're going to be able to take money out of that police force, put it into youth programs, and still, of course, keep New Yorkers safe. So he says he is not talking about destroying the police force either. Prince Andrew offering to help the U.S. Justice Department three times, according to his attorneys, uh, the uh, statement coming today in response. In With perspective comes clarity. Each week, the story seems to change. The best experts bring you the most clarity. Give us a sense of what's going on in the IPO market these days. Bonnie Quinn. Will there be an interest from LPs and newer managers here? Paul Sweeney. How are companies marketing their deals here in the time of COVID and social distancing? Bloomberg Markets. Weekday mornings at 10 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business app, and BloombergRadio.com. Bloomberg. The world is listening. If you love them enough to listen to them practice the same song on tuba, please be done. Over and over and over and over and over. Then surely you'll check NHTSA.gov slash the right seat to make sure they're correctly buckled in the back seat. Sounds good, honey. Check today at NHTSA.gov slash the right seat. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Mark